Reporting. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Integrated Coastal Resilience Capstone for the University of Rhode Island. Uh, my name is Teresa Crean. I'm a Coastal Community Planner and Extension Specialist with the URI Coastal Resources Center and Rhode Island Sea Grant. And um, this morning, we are really fortunate to have um, four of our academic departments, Ocean Engineering, Landscape Architecture, Environmental and Resource Economics, and Marine Affairs, um, undergraduate students, our senior students, graduating seniors, um, come together and share the results of their semester-long process to evaluate a coastal resilience scenario and challenge for the Watch Hill area of Westerly, Rhode Island. Um, so before we get into the student presentations, I just want to make a few housekeeping announcements. Um, so first of all, the agenda for this morning is posted over in the chat. So if you're new to Zoom, I imagine most of us probably are not new to Zoom, but if you are new to Zoom, um, you can kind of hover your mouse down toward the bottom of the page and um, there's a chat box. There's also a participant list so you can see who um, is attending this morning. So especially for the faculty that want to see which of your students are, are uh, in, the, in the room. For the students who are logging on, um, if your name is showing up as a strange, um, you know, or if it's called user or something else, you can actually change your name. If you want to make sure that your professor knows that you're here, you can rename yourself in that participant list. So I encourage you guys to do that so that we know who you are and, um, and that your professors know that you're here. Um, so I'd like to also ask, this is kind of standard practice, for you guys to mute your audio unless you're speaking or intend to speak. Um, and you can also mute or stop your video if you just want your name to show up. Um, I think it's great to see faces that are paying attention to the presentations, but when the presentation's up, we really can't see everybody's face. So I, I understand maybe this is myth, but for bandwidth purposes, it does, I've been told, it does help if we um, turn our video off when there's a presentation going on so things can run more smoothly. But that's just baby superstition, I don't know. But if you wanna turn off your video, you're welcome to do that. Um, and uh, we are recording, so I have officially hit the record button. So this will be available after the presentation. So if you want to uh, view the video or share the video with colleagues, um, we will make that available upon request. Um, okay, so with that, I would like to uh, thank, first of all, the professors who are participating in this, uh, this studio. This is the fifth year that we've done this integrated coastal resilience capstone. We've been really fortunate to have such a strong collaboration with our state agency partners, especially the Rhode Island Coastal Resources Management Council, working with our ocean engineering department to help sort of define the, um, the challenge in the spatial area that we focus on for this spring semester studio. The ocean engineering students get started on this in the fall semester and really lay the, the groundwork and the framework for what we do in the spring semester. So it's been a really nice partnership with not only the ocean engineering department, but also sort of the stakeholders that are engaged with our ocean engineers. Um, and also want to thank the landscape architecture program. We've, this is probably the eighth, maybe seventh or eighth year that we've done uh, studios out in the field focused on coastal resilience. So bringing in the, um, so thank you to uh, Professor Sheridan um, for engagement with your students and also to Professor Uchida who has really come into the mix in the last few years um, with her uh, resource economics students to bring that element and that lens into these um, these challenges that we have along our coastline, thinking about what are the economic questions and what are the data sources that we can draw from to um, address these questions. And then Professor Austin Becker and I um, worked together this semester to bring one marine affairs student, Jess Hiltz, into the mix um, as a separate independent study that she did to um, participate in this capstone. So this is a new trial that we're doing to bring in marine affairs um, into, the, into the capstone to bring that policy perspective into uh, the discussion today. So I want to thank all the professors. I want to really give a shout out to the students during this weird semester that we're having and the pivot that we had to make around spring break. You guys have really done a phenomenal job in maintaining focus and your energy and really bringing your A game um, to this process. So I want to really thank the students for going all out to keep the momentum going and really land in a place that we can provide our Watch Hill Conservancy stakeholders with um, a, a nice package of, of work, a nice portfolio of work that they can use to inform future discussions. So I just want the students to know that this work will not 
be lost or forgotten. We will be using this, um, all the materials you guys produce going forward. And, and with the conditions of this semester, I, I just can't emphasize enough that you guys have done a really great job in, um, in you know, bringing your A game. So thank you so much to all the students. Um, I also have to give a huge shout out to the Watch Hill Conservancy. We have had this semester a phenomenal stakeholder engagement process and the Watch Hill Conservancy has really raised the bar on what we are going to expect and, and hope for from stakeholders in the future working on these coastal resilience capstones. Um, Pete August, Janice Sassy, Jocelyn, Deborah, uh, Joan Beth, you guys have all been fantastic in being responsive to our students in hosting us for an amazing field trip um, a few months ago where before we could still actually uh, gather and see each other in the same place um, you really rolled out the red carpet for us and and we really could we just again can't thank you all enough for giving our students that exposure to these real world questions the real data the stakeholders who are living in this area making these decisions for businesses for sort of long-term planning in this um, high risk um, iconic landscape that we have uh, in Rhode Island. And we really, um, we've asked a lot of you and you have delivered and we just really cannot thank you enough for being available to our, our studio. Um, so with that, um, the project overall was for our four classes to focus on the Watch Hill area of uh, Westerly. The students will walk you through where that is, what the challenges are, each class will um, share with you a little nugget of what their perspective on it is on the on the challenge and then go into their analysis work and draw some conclusions i want to emphasize that this is student work so in, these are not consultants we did encourage the students to um, really think creatively and ponder and explore innovations um, we wanted them to really think um, you know, uh, in a creative way that may not be necessarily completely realistic today, but we've also wanted their thought process to be rooted in pragmatism and um, realistic solutions. So there's a little bit of dreaming and a little bit of uh, reality check that we've really encouraged throughout this semester. So we want everybody, all our stakeholders to just be aware of that and also just also protect the students from those expectations of these are not consultants, these are students, and we encourage them to really, um, you know, bring their energy and innovation to, um, to this process. So please just remember that these are students and we are helping them learn and really launch into their career phase. So this is a workforce development initiative that Rhode Island Sea Grant, which is partly funding this initiative um, through staff time and through any other types of expenses we can provide funding for, um, the idea here is to really build our next generation of coastal managers and planners and have our engineers, landscape architects, resource, economic, um, resource econ economists have this lens, have this experience of coastal resilience planning, adaptation planning and management going forward into their careers because we think, we expect that this will be a, um, a long-term um, you know, job initiative and, and um, uh, initiative across our coastlines for years to come. So this um, challenge is not going anywhere and we think there you know, likely will be um, pretty good job security in all of this. And in the past, our students who have gone through this uh, coastal resilience uh, capstone have been very successful in getting jobs. With the climate that we're in now, with um, COVID related disruptions, we are going to be working with our students to try to help them understand how to network, how to um, you know, job search during this tough time. And, um, but we have, full expectations that our students will go on to do great things. So I just wanted to make mention of that. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and launch into our class presentations. The way we're gonna do this, we do not have a scheduled break through our three hour agenda. It is a three hour agenda. Um, I did post that again in the chat room. So if you need to get up and you know, take a break, do it. Um, and just make sure you mute yourself and mute your video. Um, and we're, I'm going to pass it on to each professor when we start a new, new section and have that professor cue their students and manage that chunk of time. So it is almost exactly 9.10. So I'm going to pass the baton over to Professor Chris Baxter to introduce the ocean engineering um, students. Thank you guys so much. Good morning, everybody. I'm assuming you can hear me. So uh, I just want to, I'm going to be very brief because I, I want to get right to our students' presentations. Uh, we are thrilled to be a part of this integrated capstone. 
Uh, I want to first just acknowledge my um, uh, the faculty and the students that are working on this project. I've been working closely with Malcolm Spaulding and Craig Swanson in the Ocean Engineering Department, George Ciatis in the Civil Engineering Department, and we've had a graduate student in Ocean Engineering, Janelle Skaden, who's been helping out uh, this semester. Um, this capstone, even in the broader integrated capstone, even within our engineering capstone, this is a, a joint capstone course between ocean engineering and civil engineering. We, ha we have a mix of ocean engineers and civil engineers, which is the first time we've ever uh, integrated two engineering disciplines uh, in, our, in our capstone experience. So that's been very positive. And um, as Teresa mentioned, our capstone is a year long process. So we have focused on many things, not just the Watch Hill um, area. And so what I expect um, that you'll see in a, in a minute is sort of a mix between the overall capstone project that our students have been working on, uh, and then about half of the presentation will be focused specifically on uh, mitigation efforts in the Watch Hill area. So I think with that, uh, I will turn it over to my students. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. Can everyone, yeah, everyone can hear me. Um, so we are looking forward to hearing everyone's presentations today. So thank you all for being online with us um, and let's get started. So our title is Development and Applications of Storm Tools Design Load Maps. And this has been, as Professor Baxter mentioned, um, a team of civil and ocean engineering students who have been working on the project since the fall. Um, my name is Isabella Silverman and my student colleagues, if you guys just wanna like wave your hand as I say your name, um, are Blaze, Alexa, Michael, Allison, Joe, Brandon, and Chris. Um, and also additionally, the faculty on our project who have helped us so much along the way. Um, Dr. Spaulding, Dr. Baxter, Dr. Swanson, Dr. Ciatas, and of course, Teresa Crean. Um, so here's our overview slide um, of what the presentation will go over. And first, we're going to review our study area that we've focused on, um, provide our problem statement and study objectives and background for our, our capstone since the fall. And then we'll show some of the design load maps, which we are, are the results of our study. And finally, finish with the help um, with the mitigation measures for watch help. So as Isabella said, I'm going to begin with the study area. So it contains the entire southern coast of Rhode Island from the Winnipeg Pond Inlet all the way west to Watch Hill and Knob Tree Point. Um, this stretch of land is a good representation of Rhode Island because it contains headlands, coastal ponds, and densely populated areas, which are all relevant when computing load values and damage to structures. And obviously today we're going to be highlighting Watch Hill and Westerly. Um, overall, structures on the southern coast of Rhode Island are subjected to that threat of high wind velocity and flooding from storm surge and sea level rise. And unfortunately, there's not an effective tool that allows structural and coastal engineers to easily estimate environmental loads in response to the sea level rise. And our project aims to kind of solve this issue. Um, more specifically, this study held a couple of objectives over the past two semesters. So our focus for the first semester was developing the methodology to generate these loads, the wind, hydrodynamic, hydrostatic, and wave design for these residential structures, along with developing an SDL index to show areas of risk, which then could be compared to our series risk maps. But most recently, we looked into applying the loads to various structures in the coastal plain during different sea level rise scenarios. And we're also able to explore mitigation measures to help protect the Watch Hill community in response to sea level rise. Um, so diving into Watch Hill, we can see the various sea level rise scenarios and how they'll impact the area from storm tools. And little by little, most of the Watch Hill community feels the effects of the sea level rise, beginning with some of the parking lot being inundated and then moving all the way up to the storefronts on Bay Street seeing water. Um, following that, the figure on the right-hand corner shows the different sea level rise projections made by NOAA, which suggests about nine feet of sea level rise by 2100, which again would be absolutely detrimental to coastal communities like Watch Hill. So this is a illustration from FEMA's Coastal Construction Manual, um, just containing some important uh, terminology and concepts that we ourselves have used in the development of our design load maps. Um, the key takeaways here are distinguishing between the BFE or base flood elevation and the still water elevation level. Uh, the BFE accounts for this total water depth or the total flood level, um, in including the effects of waves. 
So what we've done is broken this down into two coefficients, DS and HB. Um, DS is representative, our uh, designs to water flood depth, um, physically, or only looking at the depth of inundation of the water, um, and HB, which is only looking at the height and impacts of the waves generated during this 100-year uh, return period storm. Uh, additionally, looking at the two properties, the one elevated on piles and the one built on grade, uh, following that blue dotted line representative of the base flood elevation, um, you can see that the structure property, uh, properly elevated within the flood zone um, is prone to significantly less damage as one would be um, built on grade. Um, and this will be shown later in the presentation uh, through some structural damage profiles that we've created. Uh, so this is the background and building blocks for CIRI, the Coastal Environmental Risk Index. Um, going into CIRI, it is taking into account the storm tools, water levels, and waves, um, using those base flood elevations as a means of characterizing flood risk, as well as the modeled storm conditions um, and wave conditions uh, for the 100-year storm. And additionally, looking at outcomes of the next study performed by the Army Corps of Engineers um, using the various residential structure types um, and elevations of the first finished floor and the appropriate wave and inundation damage functions developed in order to develop a means of categorizing the flood damage and structural risk um, to these individual structures within our designated study area. Um, so, as I mentioned, the next study, the North Atlantic Comprehensive uh, or North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study, uh, performed after Hurricane Sandy by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, this is just briefly showing this distinction between those structures built off of grade and those elevated on piles. Uh, <clears throat> So there were, uh, after the next study, there was a large uncertainty uh, in damage functions for both inundation and um, waves, uh, wave data based uh, on methodology from um, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and there was large variability as well and a uh, pretty weak engineering basis that we'll see on the next slide. Uh, so these are the uh, plots that the NAC study came up with. And as you can see, the um, lines don't exactly fit the data quite well. And this was really our goal is to give uh, a more fundamental engineering basis to our damage functions and understand it more fully. So over the past two semesters, we worked on improving the Siri flow chart. So the boxes in red are what we worked on over the past two semesters. And then what's circled in green is what's highlighted in this presentation and mainly what we worked on this semester. So we worked on developing design load maps and damage curves based on loads for different structure types. So we follow the codes within the ASCE 716 and FEMA Coastal Construction Manual to compute our design loads. The flood loads that we focused on were hydrostatic, hydrodynamic, wave, and debris loads. Um, this is our hydrostatic load map for a sea level rise of zero feet. Um, the picture shows a hydrostatic load as a distributed load and a point load, which is applied when you scale it to a structure at two thirds of the depth. Um, we also made load maps for sea level rise of two, five, seven, and 10 feet. And the link at the bottom is where you can click to access all of our load maps. This is our wave load map. You can see that the wave load um, impacts this area the most and has the highest magnitude. The cartoon also is just an example of how a wave load is applied to a vertical wall. Um, you can see that there's really um, high wave loads around Aperture Point as well. And this is our total load map. So we added the different loads together to calculate the total load on the structures. And this is the damages used. Um, we applied this to the damage of local structures and that was studied to create our damage functions that I'm gonna show you on the next few slides. 
Um, but you can see that as the sea level rise increases, um, there's more area affected by higher loads. Here's our uh, flow chart, which shows how the damage curves were determined. We have our structural member properties, such as material and the failure criteria for these properties. Incor uh, incorporating this with the FEMA fortified structure building codes, 5A and 7A structures were able to be created in our program called Autodesk. The environmental loading maps, such as the hydrostatic wave and hydrodynamic loads were implemented on these structures. And from that, the um, analysis of the damage on the individual structure members were able to be determined. And with that information, we were able to create our damage curves. Uh, so this is uh, a screen grab of the 5A structure we designed in Autodesk uh, and ran simulations on. These red arrows are pointing at individual members we analyzed the internal forces in, try to get an idea of the reaction in the entire structure. And uh, this is just a 7A structure that we designed, which is just a building on open pile foundations. So this is uh, one of the damage curves we were able to develop on a 5A structure. So single story residence with uh, no basement. So in the dotted lines is the curve developed by an expert panel from uh, just assessing damage from the MAC study. But you'll see these black dots are actually the individual data points. So that's just highlighting how, you know, there's very low correlation in the previous data. And then you can see our, uh, our curves that we've developed in the light blue. So there's just one fundamental thing that needs to be assessed about this is that the next <clears throat> was done by a percentage of damage on an entire structure, whereas our analysis method is more based on the capacity of an individual members and studs in the house. So though there's a slight nuance and difference between the two, uh, it's good to see them overlaid and see how their uh, relative shapes interact with each other. Um, so kind of bringing it back to our collaboration between the landscape architecture students, environmental resource economics, and marine affairs students, um, we've really enjoyed collaborating with everyone um, this semester, primarily through email, but also in our classes charrette that we had in early March. Um, yeah, and also thank you to our class liaisons, um, the Watch Hill Conservancy, and the Rhode Island Sea Grant, as well as all of the professors across all majors for um, helping with this great collaboration this semester. <clears throat> Uh, so here we see a snapshot from uh, Storm Tools, um, and there's been a lot of um, discussion about like the Bay Street area and specifically this row of commercial buildings um, along Bay Street. So you can see uh, this is really demonstrating the power of uh, Storm Tools in and of itself. So what you can do is you can click on a structure or a location and you get the uh, damage, like the likely damage that will occur um, during, the, uh, during the future storms, uh, depending on the sea level rise and the structure type. Uh, so you can see here, this is a 46% damage um, at the current location of the Bay Street uh, commercial buildings. Um, and again, demonstrating the power of this. So if you just move, um, theoretically, if these buildings, uh, this is a way of um, you know, kind of coastal resilience, they're just saving these buildings. Um, if they were theoretically just pushed back into that uh, parking lot behind them, um, it's slightly, uh, slightly higher in grade. And therefore, there's no, no structural damage during these during the same exact storm. Um, so they're really right on that edge there uh, in the Bay Street area. Um, so Storm Tools was used to analyze the wave crest height in the, in the map of the Watch Hill area, which can be seen on the um, left side of the screen. So this kind of helped us with looking into the nature-based solutions for the Watch Hill area. Um, so you can see the red arrow is pointing to where overtopping of the dune system can be noted with large waves penetrating like landward and impacting the structures such as the downtown area. Um, so the offshore side, which is the side that's closest to the south and the side that the um, red arrow is pointing to, we decided was best suited for the nature-based solutions um, in order to maintain the dune system. Um, so for this slide in the top right, you can see that a map from Storm Tools um, with the yellow oval that shows location of the high waves that I was just talking about in the previous slide. Um, so nature-based solutions would work well in this area to maintain the integrity of the dunes. Um, and also the star on the map is showing where the attraction of the carousel 
is. So that's kind of an important part of the Watch Hill area. Um, also, uh, in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, um, you can see some work from the landscape architecture students um, that kind of nicely relates back to what we were working on. So they came up with, um, I believe this photo shows the eelgrass um, as a nature-based solution, which we'll be hearing more about the, in the upcoming presentations, but we wanted to kind of exhibit their solutions for this area and kind of also incorporate it in our presentation. Um, so this slide is covering the solution of bioswales and their potential in helping mitigate flooding in the parking lot areas in the downtown. Um, so you can see in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, um, it's a sunny day, but there's still flooding in the parking lot. So the graph on the right, um, you can kind of see that the tides change. This is from Noah. The tides change daily. So um, and it, this would bioswales would help in mitigation of like the flooding in the parking lots. Um, so the solutions on the bottom part of the screen are also from landscape architecture students who we'll be hearing more from um, later in our the presentations. We also just wanted to highlight how um, what they're working on is really important in this project. Um, so here's some photos from Westerly, Rhode Island after the 1938 hurricane, um, just to kind of show some of the damage. So that's all for our presentation. Thank you all for listening. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions for our ocean engineering students? If you unmute yourself and start talking, I can see the yellow box around you um, <laughs> to, to facilitate those questions. Ryan? Sure. Um, did you guys evaluate how big the dunes would have to be to be functional in front of the carousel and commercial district? I will call on somebody. <laughs> Brandon? Um, yeah, that uh, we didn't necessarily take that into account. We were more so, um, you know, using what the framework already within Storm Tools is to assess these uh, wave heights and relative damage from, you know, your 100 year return period storm with the varying sea level cases, um, just to provide that information. Uh, to the other landscape architecture students um, and other, you know, capstone projects to say here are areas of high risk um, that we think these solutions uh, would be appropriate to design for um, and use for mitigation measures. Um, so we weren't necessarily looking at the design of the dunes and um, those nature-based solutions ourselves. Just for um, information's sake, uh, Professor Oakley, um, have in your work in Napa Tree, has there been any analysis or um, uh, data pulled together to estimate, you know, dune height in that area or some sort of protective structure in your in your research or work? We haven't done an official thing just for Napa Tree, but in general, you'd look at something like the FEMA 540 rule, which would be 540 square feet of uh, cross section area above the still water elevation or about 50 cubic meters per meter above still water elevation, which is pretty high. And uh, there's actually not a lot of dunes on the entire South Shore that actually meet that. Probably the big dune at the, at the far east end of Napa Tree, just um, past the, uh, the Musquamica Club. But other than that, very few dunes along that shore are that big. You gotta almost think New Jersey beach replenishment scale dunes to get up to that size. Mm. Gotcha. So a next step maybe for if the engineering students had another couple of months or weeks um, to do some sort of analysis on what kind of structure or solution could be really well designed for that area around the carousel. I love that your um, analysis maps really point to that area of vulnerability mm -hmm. because that is sort of the gateway to Bay Street and the downtown commercial area. And so to me that really highlights a um, a target, a focus area for the Washington Conservancy and other stakeholders to pay attention to um, 
in, in the study area. Yeah, there's a very famous picture somewhere in the Projo uh, 1954 Hurricane Carol supplement that shows a car buried in overwash in the parking lot right in front of the uh, the t-shirt shop in, uh, in Bay Street. So uh, overwash from that side is definitely a, a real issue. Thank you, Ryan. Great. Um, I'll also just say I appreciate you guys using this, the Storm Tools Siri app to um, look at the structural uh, damage of the buildings along Bay Street and the idea of sort of shifting those back if we were able to relocate. Um, what you're able to illustrate in a very clear way that the damage, structural damage of that could decrease if you move that bank of buildings to a higher elevation. Um, does anybody want to comment on that um, process? We have 10 more minutes until the next speaker, so I'll keep asking questions. <laughs> but I also want to encourage questions from our audience. I'm, I'm curious if anybody looked at elevating um, the structures that are kind of like right near the Yacht Club that um, those two buildings that are right there in the parking lot. Yeah, that's a good question, Madison. You guys, the engineering students, you guys did show an image of those buildings in that parking lot across from the Watch Hill Yacht Club before it was elevated, um, inundated with seawater. Um, and so I know that your, your whole uh, capstone charge was not to focus only on Watch Hill. You really looked at the whole South Coast. But um, in terms of the process you guys laid out, can this be used for other buildings in the Watch Hill area? Have yeah. You uh, a formula in your presentation that we can use to apply to other places. Yeah, I think uh, it definitely could. You know, we're trying to analyze you know every type of structure that you would find uh any typical structure that you would find in the southern coast of rhode island and realistically a lot of other states and elevated structures uh, uh elevated on piles are becoming more popular and uh, it's a pretty obvious reason we have uh some pretty good data showing too that you know most of the damage just doesn't hit the house until you know where the ffv the first finished floor elevation is which if you put it 10 feet in the air it's going to help a lot especially in a in an area that's so at risk to uh, seeing higher levels of water because it's so close and obviously with the sea level. So I think it is a viable option, but it would probably take a little bit more time to you know, see uh, all the nuances of the specific situation at hand. So if those buildings in that parking lot went from a 5A to a 7A, that would likely reduce its risk profile. Definitely, it reduces the risk profile, but um, that's always supplemented on the other hand that when the water level does hit the FFE, then the damage comes very quickly. And um, a structure getting hit on waves, if it's at grade versus a structure falling down from 10 feet in the air is uh, two different animals. So there's definitely uh, a question to be had of whether or not you could see some big damage in the likely event of a large storm. Great, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Professor Baxter, anything you want to nudge your students on before we move on to the next presentation? Uh, to be honest, I've seen this talk a few times, so I, I don't have any specific <laughs> questions. Um, I did, I did like appreciate uh, Brian Oakley's talk about the, the, the height of the dunes. And I think one thing that we're quickly realizing on the southern shore of Rhode Island is that uh, major storms like 100-year storms or 100-year storms combined with some level of sea level rise. Those are things that are, that are uh, really hard to think about designing for. But one of the nice things about, I think what we learned this year is that you can use the tools um, that we have to at least um, assess your risk and figure out what level of risk you're willing to design for. So maybe those dunes aren't for a 100 year storm, maybe they're for a 50 year storm, prevent overtopping from another Hurricane Sandy, for example. So I think, I think we, we're, we're moving, you know, for some things we're moving away from 100 year designs because there, you know, there's only so much you can do and, and uh, we're mitigating for maybe smaller events and for uh, shorter time intervals uh, and until some of the uncertainty around sea level rise uh, uh, plays itself out. 
So those are my thoughts during uh, those questions. Great, thank you. C can I ask a question? Yes. Um, I'm, curious, I'm curious coming from a design standpoint, whether uh, the material of the dunes um, makes a difference in terms of is it, uh, if you had a shape that was similar to the dunes uh, versus you know the material that it's made out with sand and all the vegetated material associated to it. Um, can you have other alternative materials that could be applied and uh, have the same result that is being stated here? And I'm coming from a non-engineering background, so I apologize that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Um, but I'd be interested to hear maybe from the students or others uh, it, it's, uh, if the materiality has a bearing on uh, its effectiveness. I'll see if any of my students want to answer that and then I, I'll, I'm happy to jump in on that one. I know in some of our, our ocean engineering classes when we talk about beach renourishment, um, kind of regarding different types of sands, um, usually in a beach, we would like to keep like first look at the type of sand on a beach. And then if we were to like renourish that area or maybe build a dune, we would use like similar types of, um, sand just because in the area, um, like the way that the wind blows and some other environmental factors, you'd want to keep the, um, sand similar to like what's in the area. Um, but I don't really, I'd let Professor Baxter additionally say things on that note. All right. Good job, Isabella. Anyway, I, I'll just add that there's a host of potential solutions. Uh, you can go from beach replenishment, like Isabella was just mentioning, to hardened breakwaters, right? And, and uh, so you've got seawalls and breakwaters on one end of the extreme, which are very rigid structures. You've got uh, just beach nourishment, which is more, if we call that a softer structure. And there are, and there are structures in between. So you, you can reinforce dunes with, with uh, a core of uh, geosynthetic sandbags or um, other other types of materials. So and 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 they have they all have slightly different responses. Um, and some are softer and some are more rigid. And that has its own uh, added effects. So uh, there are solutions, and it's just again a, ma a matter of what the you know how you want to adapt to your particular site, how you want your particular site to look uh, and respond. And uh, that's, that's what designers do in conjunction with their clients. Usually Brian Oakley has lots of, uh, lots of thoughts on that as well. So maybe I'll pass the buck back to him. I, well, I mean, maybe to follow up on that. And again, uh, Teresa, stop me if we uh, don't have enough time. Um, oftentimes in, in uh, urban settings, it's a lot about the economics of what, you know, plays out. And so, uh, Clearly, a, a natural response would be ideal in these kind of situations. But I'm wondering, in terms of how things realistically get in, uh, implemented, how does the cost effectiveness of, of artificial um, materials and forms compare against those natural type of forms in its application and, and its feasibility and how attractive it is for clients to, to implement? Yeah, I, I, I will say, I don't think it's, in, in many cases, it's not just economics. If you're talking about a site in Upper Narragansett Bay or around the Port of Providence, there's one solution that, that uh, or there are solutions that might be appropriate there. Hardened solutions might be appropriate there, but in an area like Napa Tree, where there's lots of other factors besides just pure economics, um, the other, then I think, you know, you have a variety of solutions. There have been reinforced dunes uh, there's one reinforced dune that's been constructed in Rhode Island, uh, in Musquamacut. There are others up and down the East Coast. There's a large one in Nantucket, large one in Montauk, New York. Um, and those try to strike a balance between, uh, between keeping the beaches looking like beaches and, and acting, you know, having their function uh, for tourists and, and the like, uh, and yet also providing some level of, of protection from storms and sea level rise. So it's, it's always a balance. Yeah. I'll just, since Chris called me out on it. Um, yeah, I always have a lot to say in it, but I won't take up a lot of time right now. Um, there's always unintended consequences with coastal structures and that's something you have to remember. So feasibly, could you build something shaped like the dune out of something that's not sand or even gravel that'll move? Sure, but once you put a hardened structure in, you start to lose the beach in front of it and you put a hardened structure at that particular site and it's gonna look like the adjacent part of the, the 
lighthouse without some kind of maintenance of, of the sand. And as Chris said, there's a variety of things in between. Um, the reinforced dunes have potential for sure for smaller storm events, um, but they still require maintenance as we're seeing in places like Montauk. When there's erosion back into that dune, you still have to come in if you want it to look a certain way and maintain the aesthetics with added sand or, or something like that. Um, but yeah, there's always a solution. It's just, you gotta always weigh the, the pro and the con with it. Uh, this is Emmy Tudor from Resource Economics. Just wanted to add to this conversation, um, Leonard, that uh, one of our, um, uh, the classes is in resource environment, environmental resource economics, and our students will be looking at not just costs and benefits, uh, which typically people think is economics, but economics is also about public preferences, um, and one of our teams will get at that as well. Um, so look forward to that in about an hour and a half. <laughs> you stick with us for the last hour of the yeah. <laughs> presentation this morning. We'll get there. Cool. Thank you, guys. And with that, I'm going to transition over to our next uh, class speaker. So um, Jess Hiltz is our sole student in the, from the Marine Affairs program. She's a graduating senior this year, and she has participated in um, a class called Cases in Marine Affairs that focus solely on uh, this capstone. And so she really approached the, um, uh, the problem from a policy standpoint. And I'm going to turn the floor over to her to walk you through her presentation. And then we'll have time for questions after that. So good morning, Jess, and welcome. And I will turn the floor over to you. Hi, good morning. Um, so thank you, Teresa. I'll go ahead and start sharing my presentation. <clears throat> okay. All right, so I'll be talking about coastal adaptation strategies in Watch Hill, Rhode Island. <clears throat> First off, I'd like to thank the stakeholders for their participation and help during this process. Um, huge shout out to the people over at Watch Hill Conservancy. Thank you so much for your help and support during this process. Um, I'd also like to give a quick shout out to Georgia Felber over at the Olympia Tea Room. Um, she's running a small business right now and she still took the time to talk to myself and other stakeholders, so I really appreciated that. Um, here are some resources that I use throughout the semester. So this doesn't even encapsulate all of them. Um, some of them there, Resilience Roadie and Shoreline Change Stamp. So first off, um, I chose the Olympia Tea Room as a case study for the Watch Hill area because it's a popular and iconic location. Um, it's a family owned business established in 1916. It's, a loaded, it's located at 74 Bay Street in West Bay, Rhode Island, and it's across the street from the Yacht Club parking lot. Um, the Olympia Tea Room is projected to be exposed to five to seven feet of sea level rise with two tides a day, making it um, have a high risk for structural damage from a storm event. Here are different sea level rise scenarios for Watch Hill with the blue point showing to the Olympia Tea Room. These increments go from one, two, three, five, seven, and then 10 feet of sea level rise. Um, so like I said in the previous slide, the Olympia Tea Room is at high risk for structural damage with zero feet of additional sea level rise in case there were to be a 100-year storm event. And that structural damage risk goes up to extreme with two additional feet of sea level rise. For this project, I dived into local zoning. I won't go in and explain everything here, but basically um, I went through the Watch Hill District zoning to see what is and is not permitted. Um, I also looked at the Water types. Uh, type 5 waters are commercial and recreational harbors, which is what the Watch Hill Bay area is. I also include Norfolk, Virginia. Um, I'll be talking more about Nor Norfolk later on in my presentation, um, but Norfolk is a pioneer in coastal resilience zoning. Um, they implemented a new zoning ordinance in reaction to coastal flooding, and again, I'll be talking about that more later. The three main adaptation strategies that a coastal business can implement are protection, accommodation, and retreat. Protection would include the use of some kind of structure to protect 
uh, a building from coastal hazards. Accommodation would include something like elevating the building and then retreat would be retreating inland. Therefore, potential solutions that I suggest for the Olympia Tea Room are to either retreat inland, relocate retail spaces to the second floor, create a large scale flood barrier, or create a small scale flood barrier. The first suggestion that I give is to retreat inland. Retreating inland is the best long term adaptation strategy because um, you're taking yourself away from the water line. Um, retreating inland is ultimately a better solution than relocating out of Watch Hill. Um, one of the problems with retreating inland is that pretty much all the land in Watch Hill is already owned and the land is very expensive. Um, here in the next slide, I show different places where the Olympia Tea Room could potentially relocate the blue squares, the Olympia Tea Room, and then the yellow arrows represent different areas where, <clears throat> where they could potentially relocate. Uh, the two parking lots, so the top arrow and the bottom arrow belong to the fire district, and then the middle arrow points to private property. Um, so these are again just suggested areas of retreat. Further research would need to be done to see if that is even feasible. The second suggestion I give to the Olympia team room is to relocate to the second floor. Um, for those of you who don't know, the first floor on Bay Street are pretty much all for commercial uses. And then the second floor of all those buildings are mainly residential. So therefore, if the Olympia team room re were to relocate to the second floor, uh, a modification of the space would be needed because it's residential. Um, in addition, the second floor is smaller than the first floor. So um, again, modification of the space would be needed. A different approach on relocating to the second floor could also be to elevate the tea room and potentially make the first floor parking. And that could be done in accordance with some kind of flood barrier, whether it be small or large. Uh, a smaller large scale flood barrier. The third suggestion that I have for the Olympia Tea Room is, or for businesses on Bay Street in general, is to implement a large scale flood barrier. There is a seawall that already exists there. So two different approaches could be to either build onto the existing seawall or to build another seawall, probably land side of the existing seawall. Um, Regardless, the purpose would be to stop the flooding at the source. Um, some only like downsides to that would be like every suggestion they have, it is an expensive project. And also um, with the elevated seawall, the view of the harbor may be, um, may be the, uh, blocked. The fourth and final suggestion that I have for the Olympia Tea Room would be to do some sort of small scale flood barrier. Here on these pictures, I show a sandbag method versus using some sort of flood, uh, they're called flood gates, but the gate just has um, different planks and they all are in increments of six inches. So they build up on top of each other. Um, so the idea of a small scale flood barrier would be to make it more site specific. Um, and with a small scale flood barrier, it could be semi permanent. So like in the picture on the right, the outer edge is a more permanent structure and then the planks could be put in when needed. Um, so I guess the only downside to using a small scale flood barrier, like the one picture on the right is that assembly is required once it is needed. Um, a problem I foresee on Bay Street is maybe uh, there might be some issues with parking if there's some kind of small scale flood barrier on Bay Street protecting the businesses. Um, but that's not the biggest concern right now. Um, <clears throat> here are some different examples of small scale flood barriers. 
Uh, the picture in the top left is the rising sun mills in Providence, Rhode Island. They're using uh, flood barrier panels to protect their business for an anticipated storm. The picture on the right shows the use of an aqua dam, um, which is basically a plastic tube that is filled with water. It could be just storm water that's collected. And um, this is more of a site specific adaptation strategy, but as you can see, there's flooding surrounding the house in this picture, but the house is protected by this aqua dam. Um, the picture on the bottom is another example of a small scale floodgate, basically just a, um, a hinged door that could be closed to prevent flooding. <clears throat> so, that being said, I have some considerations for future actions. Um, I have three different considerations, one being future zoning, the second one being green infrastructure, and third, feasibility assessment and cost. Here on the right, I show a picture of a bioswell, which is a type of green infrastructure strategy. Uh, and a bioswell is just a way to collect stormwater um, while also removing debris. So I, as I mentioned earlier, Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, Norfolk is home to the largest U.S. naval base, and they also are pretty much pioneers in implementing a coastal overlay zone um, to help prevent flooding. So the goal of creating this coastal overlay zone is to enhance flood resistance and direct new development to higher ground. Um, as you can see on on the right picture, the yellow areas in this show areas where neighborhoods are experiencing flooding. And then the purple areas show areas where there's less risk for flooding. Um, so the, <clears throat> the whole purpose of that is uh, for the future development. Um, so. Um, the second point is green infrastructure. Here I have two projects from the landscape architecture students. Um, as the ocean engineers mentioned earlier, this the uh, picture on the bottom shows bioswells, um, which would be a way to collect water. I really like this picture on the top right. You can see the Olympia Tea Room in the background, but this is just another way of a more natural approach to coastal resilience. Lastly, another consideration for the future action is to do some kind of feasibility assessment and to assess the cost. Um, I listed here the different project groups that the economic students are doing. Um, an example of a feasibility assessment or what a feasibility assessment even is, is just the comparison of different options um, in terms of costs, relative re resilience and obstacles to consider. So my example here is Corn Neck Road in Block Island. This was done a couple years ago, a few years ago, and they were trying to figure out how to repair this road. And they had three different options. And as you can see in the table, they laid out the obstacles to consider, the costs. So that the feasibility, feasibility assessment would be probably the next step when comparing the different options I give the Olympia Tea Room. All right, and if anybody has any questions, um, but that is the end of my presentation. Great, thank you, Jess. Yeah. Okay, um, we have about six minutes for questions for Jess. And Jess, you can stop sharing your uh, presentation unless we have a request to see a graphic. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Jess Hiltz? Hey, this is Austin. Can you hear me? Hi, yeah. Austin. Yes, welcome. Um, great job, Jess. I'm wondering what, what's your thought on what the owners of the Olympia Tea Room would, would prefer to do? Um, I think 
ultimately, I know that the owners of the Olympia Team Room don't want to move out of the Watch Hill area. They want to stick in the area. Um, I think that they'll probably end up using a combination of different strategies. Uh, I suggested earlier that maybe they could elevate the tea room and implement small scale flood barriers. So I honestly, I can't give my like perspective on which one would be better. I just, so I think that ultimately the owners of the team room would probably end up using some kind of small scale flood barrier in accordance to another strategy. Um, but also so a, short, a short term um, solution, not a long term solution. Oh, like a short term solution. Well, um, no, yeah. that's what that would suggest is that you think that they're probably going to go with a short term solution and not look at the longer term strategies. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think they'll do that. We'll go Pete, August and then Deborah. I see I see hands up and unmutedness. <laughs> uh, Jessica, um, when we spoke with Georgia uh, a week or two ago, I found it very interesting what she told all of us about her constraints with the septic system. Could you brief people on that too? I thought that was a very interesting yeah. twist. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna pull up my notes, but um, basically we talked to Georgia, like you said, and um, they're on their third and last septic system. Um, and with the size of the septic, septic system that they have, they are unable to get another permit for one. Um, so their next septic system will have to be moved to higher ground and drier ground. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it correct me if I'm wrong, but it was basically they need to relocate where their next septic system is going to be, and it's going to have to be more inland and higher up. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you told the story well. The septic <laughs> system is really the tail wagging the restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Deborah. Yes, thank you very much. That was a terrific presentation, Jessica. No, I am thank very you. intrigued with your um, your presentation about the Norfolk zoning. Um, mm -hmm. I'm an urban planner by training. Uh, zoning's a little tool I love. Um, so I wanted to hear more about what is required with those coastal overlay uh, components. Uh, are those uh, property owners required to elevate their structures? Are building permits limited to certain kinds of um, uh, building response? Uh, could you explain that a little bit more? And then I saw that Nancy Latendra is here on here. Terrific, Nancy. Nancy is a, a planner with the town of Westerly. So she may also have some questions about this. Yeah, um, so I did dive into the different um, permitted and prohibited uses in Norfolk. Uh, for new buildings, the ground floor elevation has to be three feet above the 100 year base floodplain. Um, and I believe, so that's for areas that are more susceptible to flooding. And then the areas that are higher up, they need a 1.5 elevation. Um, in addition to requiring these new elevations, they also are pushing new development to be up on higher ground and not along the coast. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Nancy, did you want to come on um, zoning in Westerly if you're available? I did see Nancy was logged on, but she may have had been called out on a, another meeting. Okay, uh, any other questions for Jess? I think as we've um, talked through this semester, you know, we've really been trying to sort of guide Jess to position questions and discussion points for the Watch Hill Conservancy to uh, move forward in just having a, a suite of resources to start to consider what might be those shorter term um, strategies. So I wanna thank Jess for putting this together. She's also been learning uh, ArcGIS story maps as a task through this semester. And so the idea here is to take her PowerPoint presentation 
and populate a story map that can then be used and shared um, for the Watch Hill Conservancy. So we hope to have that uh, in a, some sort of form by the end of the semester in a week or two, and we'll definitely share that. I also just, while I'm on that point, want to mention that um, Megan Elwell is on the call today. She's our um, MESM, our Master's of Environmental Science and Management um, Sea Grant funded fellow that has been with, uh, with uh, my office, CRC, for the spring semester, and she'll be returning in the fall semester. But we are able to hire her for the summer to help in part of her job. We'll be helping with populating a story map that tells the story of this whole integrated capstone with all four classes. So we are looking forward to taking what you guys are seeing today and making it into a you know clickable story map that captures all of this. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, to tee that up. So thank you, Jess. It is 10 o'clock. We are right on time. Nice job. <laughs> Our stakeholders for those thoughtful questions. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Professor Richard Sheridan to introduce the landscape architecture students. Take it away, Richard. Okay. Sir, use Thank you, Teresa. On, on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been a, a unique experience. Each time we do these projects, it's, uh, it's like t uh, developing a new course. We move from site to site, We've gotten to know each other from an academic standpoint, and we've become friends, and the faculty have become friends. And Sea uh, Grant, with its generosity, and uh, CRC, um, with its um, <coughs> help, have made this a unique kind of experience for teaching landscape architecture. Um, the idea of landscape architecture is that it's basically a blend of uh, science and art, and um, uh, and that uniqueness uh, of problem solving and design coming together at a table is something that uh, happens at a lot of different schools. But this is one of the few schools where we really have the ability to take advantage of this. Uh, students uh, don't realize it quite yet what a unique experience it is, but once they get out there in the world, we've been doing this for uh, five or six years, or actually I've been working with Teresa for about eight years or nine years, I can't remember. Um, but, um, you know, we find that our students are actually becoming leaders within the offices uh, of landscape architecture, the major design offices in, um, in Boston, in New York, in Philadelphia, and other places all around the country. Um, and, and they're starting to win competitions that have to do with sea level rise. And, uh, and they're starting to learn uh, to, learn to uh, communicate uh, natural systems into, their, uh, into the design solutions. And this is key. And today, um, <coughs> we're gonna have uh, three students that are gonna talk to you, Spencer, uh, Joe, and Nick. And um, they're going to uh, just do an overall kind of a breeze through a very intense semester where each student came up with an individual solution. Uh, <clears throat> not unlike uh, what Jessica did for her work in, um, in Austin's class and for uh, Teresa's class. Uh, you know, so it's like, it's amazing to watch this and to think about how we're bonding together virtually now a new concept and and how that's going to change the profession of landscape architecture in landscape architecture education. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Spencer Beebe. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. I'd first like to uh, say on behalf of all the landscape architecture students, uh, thank you for your time and involvement within this capstone and all the knowledge that you've provided with provided to us. So as you may know by now, our integrated capstone takes place in Watchill. The Watchill Village extended from the livery down to the historic carousel and over to Napa Tree Point. So our senior class is made up mostly of undergraduate students, but we are fortunate enough to have Seth, who is a graduate MESM student and has a bachelor's in civil engineering. And he provides our class with a very unique perspective to design. And with the interdepartmental capstone, two of our students served as liaisons between the majors. Myself, along with Carl, were able to coordinate presentation graphics as well as provide information to students and in the other programs. So as an overall uh, overview to our project, Watch Hill is undoubtedly one of New England's coastal gems. 
historically developed to take optimal advantage of its superb peninsular shore location. Its natural and historic fabric are assets to be treasured and preserved. <clears throat> Excuse me. Working with stakeholders in the Watchful Conservancy, students are challenged to address three feet of sea level rise, storm surge, historic character, and commercial development in multidisciplinary fashion by understanding unique design problems that are broad in scale and complex in nature. So throughout the analysis phase, I'll be discussing first why Watch Hill, and then onto our site visit, being the stakeholders, the site inventory and analysis, guidance from Beta Group, our design charrette with the other majors, conceptualization, and finally drawing and diagramming before we move into the design proposal. So there's one thing that we've learned throughout this capstone and actually throughout senior year is that investing in good design is good business. And going into good business, Land Design, which is a multidisciplinary firm all around the country, recognizes that good design is the implementation of creative collaboration, feeling like a true contributor, and designing to make an impact. And all these together are tools that we have used in order to create a beautiful and more importantly, influential design for the Watchell area. And a quote that Professor Sheridan provided to us in the beginning of the semester was, make no little plans, they have no magic to stir people's blood. And this quote is from Daniel Burnham, a famous American architect, and more of a tone center for our capstone and how we decided to go about things. So for an introduction, why Watch Hill? A fashion design magazine, Vogue, wrote an article last summer about the town of Watch Hill entitled, The Charming Rhode Island Village You Should Visit This Summer. And we decided on this capstone, for this capstone, we chose Watch Hill because of its historical character, its integration of people and recreation through its beaches and napa tree, its iconic historic value with the ocean house and the carousel, as well as its iconic coastal views throughout all of Watch Hill. And again, Watch Hill is undoubtedly one of New England's coastal gems, and that's due to our uh, capstone project statement. And this picture of Bay Street really relates uh, the project not only to New England itself, but Rhode Island specifically. And it's the perfect capstone topic to be doing at the University of Rhode Island. So in our analysis, we were challenged at looking at three feet of sea rise, but as a landscape architects, it's our duty to look beyond that and plan for the future and see what we can do in terms of innovation and design to address resiliency past the three feet sea level rise mark. So during the analysis process, we were fortunate enough to have a registered landscape architect to not only provide us with local perspective into Watch Hill, but a professional perspective in terms of class collaboration. And this was Nathan Sosha, and he is from a multidisciplinary firm called Beta Group. So from there, we split up into our analysis teams into four specific groups, commercial and residential, historic and cultural, green spaces, and infrastructure. And from historical character, we identified four main points, the flying carousel, the oldest carousel in the US, the iconic ocean house that sits on the top of Watch Hill, the chief Ninigret statue that commemorates the Native Americans, the French and Indian War, and also how Watch Hill got its name. And finally, the Hurricane of 1938 Memorial that sets the tone for the capstone in terms of coastal resilience for the area. We identified that 21.6% of the Watch Hill area is green space, and this does include Napa Tree as well as the long, along commercial Bay Street. And looking at sea level rise and storm surge from storm tools, we had identified areas of high risking, high risk, including the parking lots and how they would be impact and impacted with utilities as well as underground infrastructure and the pedestrian nodes, as well as the existing mitigation storm surge tools, uh, including the seawall, as well as the existing roads and the underground infrastructure and how those will be impacted by sea level rise. And going into the conceptualization, we looked at precedence, a precedent project, which is, which is titled Climate Ready Boston. And this project focuses on the city of Boston being coastally resilient in the downtown area, as well as the North End. And this area of Boston is extremely susceptible to flooding and with the rising rate of sea level rise, sea level rises, uh, Boston needs to prepare. And with this precedent having been analyzed before the coronavirus, we started collectively as a class by thinking about the natural and historical fabric of the Watch Hill area and how these are assets to be treasured and preserved. And one thing we were able to do before as a whole class before the coronavirus was conceptualized drawings where we broke, up, broke off into teams in order to get a sense of what 
might work in the area in terms of resiliency. And Madison Holland, one of the seniors in the landscape architect architecture programs closed the conceptual phase with recognizing that storm surge and sea level rise are two sides of the same coin. And with the collaboration between environmental and natural resource economics, we were able to analyze their data collected from the community, excuse me, community showing the distance traveled to Watch Hill. Many of the current residents of the area are within 10 minutes, uh, 10 minute driving or less, which makes it possible, which makes possible design proposals much more open uh, with vehicular traffic. As well, we were able to utilize the community's preference of a 30 year resi resilient resiliency plan compared to a 100 year plan. And with a large majority of the community advocating for a 30 year coastal resilience plan, our class will be focusing heavily on that. I also want to acknowledge that being impacted so differently with the pandemic, we have all had different resources due to the relocation of our workspaces and information. But we're thrilled to be here with you today uh, as our class and present to you with what our class has done and been able to come up with for the area of Watch Hill throughout this semester. And with that, I'll be moving into the design aspect of the students, of all our students' work for the capstone with Joe. Uh, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yep. All right, cool. So now moving into the design phase. Um, in order to classify each of these projects, we decided to group them into one of three categories for a better understanding. Each project will be labeled in either the low, medium, or heavy development groups. And what this represents is the amount of disturbance to the existing site, which includes infrastructure, infrastructure removal, um, or relocation and ecological changes to vegetation and the natural ecosystem in Watch Hill. If the site is tagged as low development, there is very little change to the existing infrastructure and it focuses more on uh, the ecological aspects of Watch Hill. And if the site is tagged as heavy development, there's a drastic change to the site, including infrastructure and the natural ecology and ecosystems on the site. <clears throat> so we're gonna start with uh, vehicular access and this focuses on offsite and onsite access as well as parking. So this design by one of our classmates utilizes um, offsite alternative transportation. In her phase one on the left side of the screen, she utilizes trolley routes and shared bike lanes to access the site. Additionally, her design provides satellite parking, which provides 612 parking spots. And her phase two, which is on the right, reconfigures Bay Street, making the street a one-way travel. And this design adds 88 spots to the site and reduces impervious services by about 38%. So this next design by one of my classmates also incorporates satellite parking. This design is parking at the marina, the airport, the golf club, um, and along Bay Street. The marina offers at 120 spots, the airport offers 350 spots, the golf club offers 105 spots and Bay Street is still offering 225 spots. And all this parking will be provided with transportation through bus shuttles to and from each spot. Um, with these existing site, the parking capacity um, is currently five, about 548 um, vehicular parking spots. And with this next proposed design, the capacity is reduced to 506 uh, vehicular parking spots in order to phase out vehicular traffic across the site into the future. Again, the existing site um, has the parking capacity of 548 vehicles and this next design <clears throat> um, offers 300 spots. The parking along the cabana in this design has been removed and turned into green space. Um, an additional parking lot has been added between the cabanas and the stores. The parking lot on the southern end of the site has been more appropriately laid out um, as, as well as the parking lot on the northern end of the site. This next design focuses on the lot on the southern end of the site. So here my classmate proposes a 300 car capacity parking garage. It has a rooftop garden which assist, assists with water filtration and offsetting carbon footprint. And additionally the vertical plantings um, on the parking garage attempt to lessen the visual impact from neighboring residents. And here's a perspective of the rooftop garden. Um, this offers a new perspective of Watch Hill and the harbor from the rooftop. 
This is a little before shot of the vehicular axis along the cabanas in the beach club. And this design implements permeable paving to aid with water runoff and infiltration. Also included in this design is improved pedestrian access to the site through pedestrian and bike path and the vegetated berm um, along the water uh, or along the seawall is raised six feet to maintain access to Napa Tree Point in the event of flooding. So next we are going to go into pedestrian connectivity, which includes exploring, learning, and protecting the site. As you can see, the existing pathways on the site, they mainly work around vehicular traffic and they don't focus on pedestrian safety. With this proposed design, the vehicular traffic works around the pedestrian access. With the implemented pathways, full site exploration uh, is possible, connecting the livery, the carousel, Napa Tree Point, and anything in between. In this visual il illustration of the Washoe Cove, directly across from the beach cabanas, you can see the proposed boardwalk that connects um, to the stone seating area that doubles as a storm surge barrier uh, and the proposed bioswale retention areas. In this design, an addition of 3.5 acres of green space is proposed. This design gives visitors more space to enjoy that is away from vehicular access. It increases plant biodiversity with the addition of a formal garden, as you can see in the uh, middle of the plan. Um, space is provided for future farmers markets, gatherings, events, and activities, and it provides areas for education and tours. Finally, this space is fully ADA accessible for anyone that is handicapped. This illustration shows the proposed green space of the last design. You can see the series of paths throughout the area. It somewhat resembles the URI quad, with, um, and then you have the gazebo in the center of the green space. So again, you can see the existing pass, pathways on the site, mainly working around vehicular traffic, um, not focusing on the pedestrian safety. With this next design, um, an addition of 2,250 linear feet of pathways was um, added. These walkways improve pedestrian circulation and accessibility. They allow pedestrians to gain a full experience of the ecological spotlight and coastal gem of Watch Hill. And they act as a constant uh, lookout point to the rest of the site and into the cove. And this brings back uh, some historical significance of what the site used to stand as. Um, a lookout point during the French and Indian War. So this next design, um, similar with pathways, but um, the main aspect of this design is the netting seating area that bumps out along the seawall, from allowing pedestrians to relax and really interact uh, directly with the rising sea level um, uh, on the site. So this design focuses on a range of connections. Proposed is um, a living seawall, a raised harbor walk, and new vehicular lanes all added to the southern tip um, of the site along the cabanas. Again, the existing pathways on the site, mainly working on the vehicular traffic and not focusing on pedestrian safety. This design also has improved connections, but in a different way, than, uh, than what we've seen to the, previ uh, to the previous designs. These connections run throughout the site, but also a boardwalk that runs over the water throughout the cove as seen in the plan. So we'll now uh, move into ecological revitalization, which will specifically focus on native vegetation, habitat restoration, and education. So this first design involves a living shoreline along the seawall in order to restore the habitat. And <clears throat> these are the plants used throughout the design, which can really hit home for anyone living in the area because these plants can not only be used um, along the shoreline or any other shoreline, but it can also be used in landscapes of residents' homes um, due to their the salt tolerant uh, capabilities. Um, so in like in the homes in this area, um, they'd really be able to, to do well. 
This next, uh, this next design focuses on um, <clears throat> uh, habitat restoration. So this design restores habitat through cultivating eelgrass uh, varieties, which allows for targeted ecology to diffuse surges in Little Narragansett Bay, um, introducing new biodiversity to Watch Hill and supporting migration that is vital to the area. This design also focuses on habitat restoration and education through the tidal pools proposed, which you can see at the southern end of the, uh, um, of the site, almost near the cabanas. So through this design, the coastal dunes, the intertidal zones, and the sandy flats, um, existing infrastructure is utilized, biodiversity is increased, the existing ecology is supported, and exploration and diversity is encouraged. This illustration shows the proposed tidal pools um, along the cabanas. You can see the encouraged pedestrian interaction, um, the, bi the biodiversity in the pools and the existing ecology um, being supported. So now I'm gonna turn this over to Nick for the second half of uh, the presentation. Thank you, Joe. So hi everyone, my name is Nick Murata, and I'm thrilled to be able to represent some of our class's work for this capstone. So in that spirit, I'll jump right into green infrastructure. And so we need to start by defining it. So what is green infrastructure? Green infrastructure is defined as an approach to water management that protects, restores, or mimics the natural water cycle. Basically, it's combining infrastructure into nature. So with the help from the ocean engineering students, we were able to take into consideration the wave crest elevations and produce possible defenses of extreme damage to the beach club as well as the cabanas along the cove. In this first student's design, bioswales are a key design element. Confronting sand dunes and wave attenuation is a difficult problem to take on, and so research into seaweed became very promising. Seaweed along Narragansett Bay can produce problems including beach closures, habitat loss, aesthetic issues, and climate issues. In a study conducted by Texas A&M, excess seaweed was utilized to stabilize sand dunes on beaches. By compacting these particular seaweeds into blocks, they're able to be buried beneath newly formed sand dunes in order to stabilize the dunes, work as fertilizer for the vegetation, and reduce the amount of nitrogen being re released into the water. So this idea will be implemented in the area directly adjacent to the beach cabanas in an effort to reduce wave action. With this research, these dunes will hold up aggressively to wave action as well as promote sustainable growth. In this first section, you can see the ocean front moving into the beach cabanas and then finally out onto the cove. As it's shown, the bioswales are integrated into the raised topography and begin to retain the future sea level rise from one to five feet. As another positive attribute, the sea bales that are built into the dunes adjacent to the cabanas provide reinforcement in order to reduce the impact of maximum wave crest heights into the Watch Cove, which was information that was provided by Pete August, so thank you, Pete. And then finally, this next section represents the existing entrance into the cove parking lot, highlighting the bioswales implemented. Along Bay Street, there would be an implementation of one-way traffic, as well as open green spaces and bioswales. The quarried stone seating area will serve as a storm surge protection, which intersects with proposed 12-foot boardwalk that connects the entirety of the site. Through five feet of sea level rise, the site remains resilient, as can be seen here. And then here's another student's project that considered bioswales and berms. This section cut indicated on the map highlights bioswales, walkways, an elevated berm, and a raised seawall. So here's the first section cut. And highlighted here are the bioswales along the road containing various species of salt tolerant plants, shrubs, and grasses. Illuminated here is the pedestrian activity throughout the site. You can see the walkway through the elevated berms in the middle of the section, which are at a high point. Shown here is the elevated berm and raised seawall. The berm contains a variety of species of plants, shrubs, and grasses, and this section of the wall has image engravings, which show the historical tale of Watch Hill running alongside its face. Then moving on to a different student's work, you won't find bioswales, but you will find vegetated berms. So in this scenario, you see what the coastline north of the cabanas would look like with the implementation of a vegetated berm at our current sea level. Here you see it with six feet of sea level rise. As the rendering shows, the cabanas in a very high sea level rise scenario seem to hold up pretty well while also maintaining that vehicular access road. This student's project, which Jessica showed before, 
The design is meant to mimic the sand dunes over on the Watch Hill beaches with two to four foot sloping grassy mounds weaving throughout. This design will have a constructed edge where people can sit and hang out and another side that will act as an ecological corridor containing coastal plants and grasses that will also encourage natural growth. Another student's design actually calls for raising the site and seawall by six feet, which corresponds to the 2100 prediction line of seven feet of sea level rise. This proposal adds a tiered defense strategy, starting with the seawall and extending up the raised berm, which includes a pedestrian walk. In an attempt to add more greenery to the site, a pergola walk embellished with ivy is also added, which provides rare shade on this site and also separates pedestrians from vehicle, vehicles. And then from there, we'll move on to, from, full, from berms to full-blown coastal dunes. So you'll notice in this student's design, that the main focus is to mitigate sea level rise through the succession of the existing coastal dunes. These dunes would move north, taking over the existing parking lot and expanding the existing natural habitat in Watch Hill. So at stage one of the coastal dune succession, a sandbar is created by the deposition from large waves breaking offshore. As you can see in the diagram, unobstructed wind carries sand inland while pioneer plant communities invade the bay side of the bar. At stage two of the coastal dune succession, the formation of a dune begins at the thicket line with the deposition of the wind-blown sand. This diagram depicts how wind deposits sand at the thicket line while dune grass spreads along the north-south line of the sand. At stage three of the coastal dune succession, the formation of a second dune begins as the dune grass community is established. This occurs as sand accumulates on the dune and as wind removes sand from in front of the dune. At the bay side, thicket and woodland plants invade the rising back dune sand under the protection of the growing secondary dune. At stage four of the coastal dune succession of five, the dune grass advances seaward toward the high tide line. This allows for the formation of the primary dune, and this, all, this occurs at the mesic conditions along dune grass communities to spread seaward. So at the bay side of the bar, thicket and woodland communities advance north and south behind the secondary dune. And then finally, the fifth stage of coastal dune succession, the primary and secondary dunes are established. This is a direct result of salt spray being reduced by the primary dune and ground level rise. Xeric thickets replace dune grass and the second dune is, is stabilized. Dune grasses are replaced by plants not requiring sand deposition and the woodland is established behind the stabilized dune. So we'll continue on the path of dunes now with this student's concept. Here you'll see artificial walking, walkable dune structures along Bay Street, which serve as a passive green space that would provide habitat and protein for native and migratory bird species while filtering toxins from stormwater before they return to the ocean. You'll notice a few cross sections here, which we love. In this first section, the green space would provide access to Watch Hill Cove through a series of granite blocks protruding out onto the water. Here you can see the walkable dune area, which has a custom built structure for sightseeing. And in section C, a traditional gazebo that's been on site for years has been relocated to provide a point to rest and observe native and migratory wildlife that will pass through these dunes. And here's a perspective from the Yacht Club engines looking out onto those dunes. So that project was actually a very good segue into the next type of design, which draws heavily on nature for its inspiration, bringing us to biomimicry. So what is biomimicry? It's defined as the design and production of materials, structures, and systems that are modeled on biological entities and processes. So we learned at our mid-semester, let me do this. We learned at our mid-semester review with students and faculty from all the departments here that Watch Hill is one of the most important places and rest areas globally for bird migration. And this is why this student's design is inspired heavily by the anatomy of a bird. And so when you take a look at the anatomical geometry of a seabird, and its ability to utilize sea winds for flight, transpose that idea into the landscape and look at the ability to utilize sea currents and sea level rise for mitigation. This student actually coined the term allotecture, which is derived from the Greek word ala, meaning wing, and texture being a derivative of the word or phrase landscape architecture. So here in this design, you'll notice wing-shaped jetties which provide a new dimension to the seawall. This design increases boat access, optimizes land access, promotes aquatic recreation through new fishing inlets and boat launches, and encourages tidal sediment entrapment to pinch off high-risk sea level rise impact zones along the perimeter of the inner cove. And then from there, we've saved the most radical interventions for last, with the heaviest level of development earning the title heavy infrastructure, at least in our books. So with that, we'll move right along and we'll start with buildings. So we'll begin with the changes to buildings 
So these are the existing locations of the carousel, the shops, and concessions. And you'll notice in this design that a few buildings have been changed. The carousel has been moved from its original location to the northern end of the site near the Harbor House Inn. The L-shaped group of buildings at the southern end of the site have been flipped and concession stand has been moved more inland away from the water. Here you'll notice the same set of buildings. And you'll see how they shift in this design out of the flood zone, which was projected by storm tools. You see a similar approach to building relocation in this design. However, this one maintains that the carousel remained in its current location. This student actually took the armored wall approach, as you do, proposing that the entire site be raised to meet the 15 foot contour elevation so as to totally eliminate any threat of sea level rise and storm surge. So this type of design, while radical, does also provide an abundance of new parking spaces. Not that that's necessarily something we're trying to promote, but it is an asset. This student had some interesting concepts by proposing these movable structures, which aren't a means for sea level rise or storm surge mitigation at all, but rather allow for small seasonal businesses to pop up and operate, which will help attract more people to Watch Hill. And finally, we have the floating island approach. So this student suggested a floating island that would be mostly moored in the marshy areas of Little Narragansett Bay. So in the event of a major storm surge, the island would be towed to the cove opening and would serve as the first line of defense in wave velocity mitigation. Some islands were to be designed with recovered and recycled ocean plastics, and others were to be utilized or were to be utilizing decommissioned barges as a means of forming chain mitigation strategies out on the water. But for a number of reasons, these, idea weren't really, these ideas weren't really brought further, but show the amazing opportunities that we've had in our department to get really, really creative with our design solutions. And so that pretty much wraps up our section here. And we thank you for listening. I don't know who to turn it to, probably Teresa, um, for questions, comments, or anything else. So thank you very much. Great, nice job, Nick, um, Spencer, and Joe presenting that information. Before I turn it over for questions, um, I do just wanna make a, a comment about, that presentation was fantastic. And I appreciate how difficult it is for the presenters and for the other students to relay what you want the punchlines to be for the presenters to really articulate your design vision appropriately in a presentation like this. So hats off to the presenters for the challenge that you had in communicating other students' work, which is really hard, and also hats off to the other students who provided you with those punchlines that they wanted to share with the audience to make sure that their design vision got across in this mass presentation. There's a lot of art and uh, um, creativity and attention to detail that went into crafting that script that you guys delivered beautifully. Um, so I just wanted to call attention to that because I do think there's a lot of, of nuance in that presentation that, um, that was really well crafted. And I, I just want to commend all the students in this class for, for doing that really well. Um, so with that, I also really just want to say too, I love how you guys, I've seen a couple of iterations of this presentation and it really came together nicely with that sort of low, medium and high, um, heavy development uh, scenarios. It was a really nice progression through um those different types of alternatives and i think gives the watch hill conservancy a lot to chew on and moving forward so that's my thumbs up to you guys thank you deborah um, <laughs> and uh, with that i will open up the uh the floor to uh questions we are pretty well ahead of schedule right now so we do have some time for questions and discussion and um just uh unmute yourself and say something so i can see the yellow box around your thumbnail who's first I'll start. Great. Um, so thank you guys for presenting. That was really thorough. And uh, I'm still trying to, this is my first time seeing everything. So there's a lot to digest. And then you gave uh, three levels to digest on top of that. And um, uh, it's really interesting to see the variety of space because I'm, I'm thinking about my own students work in general. Like uh, oftentimes we try to come to one solution uh, as an as an end response, I think it's really appropriate in these type of situations to provide you know multiple, very responses and to be thinking about them in a diversity of scales as well. Um, I'm curious though. There's a lot of you know presentation about the the structural changes that will be happening, and I think I thought it was so cool, especially uh, that you guys were able to coordinate with other experts and interests and fields um, to come up with some of your 
designs um, that are really uh, imaginative. Um, I'm wondering, I'm curious about how you think uh, the, the people 30 years from now will experience your projects. And obviously the, there might be some you know, demographic changes and those kind of things too, but there's always a conflict about um, historic preservation and what we choose to preserve and then what we choose to change. I'm wondering what kind of processes you guys went through to select what you should choose or keep and what you hope to see uh, might be offered to the next generation. Great. Yeah. I, oh, Nick, were you going to go? Uh, okay. It's okay. You beat me to it. Go for it. Okay. Um, yeah. So basically um, what we've kind of really looked at and we've had in the past with our past classes is looking into the future and kind of trying to see who's going to be moving into the site. Obviously right now, a lot of these site is um, uh, elderly people. It's, it's definitely going to be an evolving site. And at least through my design, I'm really focusing on more of um, into 30 years is more of a pedestrian oriented site, bringing a lot more um, connectivity throughout the site with pedestrian pathways and connections to a lot of the historic character on site, as well as with the uh, survey from environmental natural resource economics on the willingness to uh, preserve and pay for things. One of the main things was preserving the historical character of the site. And that's one of the main things with uh, the relocation of buildings. Most of the buildings along Bay Street, if moved or enhanced or anything like that, would, if anything, be raised up. Not much of the building facades would be changed. A lot of that character would stay the same, as well as the carousel and the buildings within kind of closer to the Yacht Club as well. Yeah, I would also, I'll jump onto that question as well. In terms of what people might think of our designs, you know, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, I mean, really only time will tell what sea level rise actually occurs in this area and all over the world and so i think that by our class having proposed a variety of designs varying in intensity or development um, we sort of cover all of those bases we have the low development scenarios and we also have the really high you know 15 foot contour designs as well so i think that the only way we'd ever know that is to see what would happen in the future and pick whichever design correlates best to what the change in climate um, provides for us. Great. Thank you guys. Um, one note I want to I want to make before we move on to the next question is, you know, you guys mentioned a couple of times um, throughout the presentation and um, sort of a focus on an aging population or designing for um, different uses like with wheelchair users or the you know, disability, like uh, mobility impaired um, audience. I want you guys to think about as you move forward in your careers, the whole concept of universal design. I don't know how common that is now. I have a book on it from 20 years ago that we used to really, you know, think about design for everybody. And you're not just necessarily putting, um, you know, focusing your designs on one population, but you're making it accessible to as many people as possible without, you know, calling out a ramp for only wheelchair users or an area only, you know, to kind of cater to, um, to seniors, um, but really thinking about design for everyone. And so I just, I want to plant that in the seed with you because I think it does go a long way with certain audiences when you can sort of just level the playing field for, for all users. And especially with this new challenge, um, you know, having that opportunity to, you know, think about universal design and that um, sort of leveling of the playing field for everyone is the time to do it. So I just, that, that popped into my head as you guys were talking and I just wanted to point that out. Richard, did you want to add to that? Yeah, that was, a, that was a very good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, but I, I, uh, I was watching something um, yesterday. Uh, it was a webinar on uh, complete streets and how the pandemic has changed the issue of complete streets. In other words, what's happened is now that everybody's abandoned the streets, all these people that have got plans our strategic uh, actions are implementing them. So when we come back from our, we're released from this uh, uh, confinement and so forth, um, we come back to a new world and you have lanes that have been designated and this is happening in, uh, in cities all over the world. Paris, Milan, New York, uh, Philadelphia. And these uh, types of, uh, of implementations uh, because people had plans or they had ideas uh, for many years and they had them rolled up 
uh, put into draws and they brought them out at the right opportunity. The key thing that we really haven't mentioned here is that Napa Tree Point is one of the basic places that people did not go back to in our country after the storm. Uh, so that's, uh, that's retreat uh, in a big way. Uh, and it's something that uh, really should be focused on as someone that knows more about social sciences than I do, uh, should come to the, uh, you know, bring that fact out. And so there has been some sort of retreat that's happened here. If you look at the maps of these things, as my students did intensely, uh, you'll start to pick up pockets where the next retreat is going to actually have to happen, uh, where the inundation is going to happen, just from the storm uh, tool maps. So this is gonna be a place that's gonna be dynamic over the next 30 years, whether it wants to be or it doesn't want to be. And so we really have to start to think about and put together that overall kind of plan that will be dynamic and change and uh, take advantage of uh, natural systems that actually make decisions for us as we go along. So I, I, my hat's off. This pr presentation just knocked me out. It was great. You guys did a great job. Um, all the students this semester did a great job. I can't say that enough. But anyways, it was fun. Great. Thank you, Richard. I see Pam Rubinoff is in the house and also unmuted. Pam, do you want to chime in? Nope. Okay. I, I saw she was unmuted, so I went there. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Any other students who didn't present want to make any comments before we move on to uh, the economics group? I want to know which is their favorite uh, and that they feel is uh, one that is maybe possible but also imaginary for the future uh, amongst the array that you that you guys were able to share. You're allowed to say your own. <laughs> I think Nick's gone. Oh, okay. I was volunteered to speak again. Um, I mean, well, I think it's really interesting to see the variety of, of concepts that we've produced because some are very low impact, very realistic, and others are much more imaginative. And I think to continue on the course of the status quo of just putting houses up on lollipop sticks and, you know, just keep raising and raising and raising. Not only does that get boring, but that doesn't seem very innovative. And so I think some of our strategies, whether they be, you know, a, an armored wall approach or floating island mitigation, whether that kind of concept could work or not, I think um, the imaginative ones are definitely fun and they provide the inspiration for, you know, watered down realistic designs of that same concept. So I don't have a favorite. <laughs> I bet Spencer does though. I don't have a favorite, but you guys missed out on the uh, the graphics of Carl's bird flying through the air. Oh. <laughs> that was cool one with biomimicry. And if, if there's nothing in the story map. Yeah, and yeah. and if there's nothing else um, to add, not closing the speakers list or anything, but um, I would also just like to give a quick shout out to Professor Sheridan too. I know he's probably not the only one, but he's done such a really good job at keeping us all together and keeping us on task this whole semester. Our whole process is based on collaboration. And when you can't meet together, that becomes obviously a little bit of an issue. So I think he deserves, as do all the faculty, um, a special shout out for making this happen. So thank you all. Yay, thank you. Deborah. I see you are unmuted. I am unmuted because I didn't want the opportunity to go by to, um, I, I really want to thank this group of students. The, these presentations are just spectacular. And I was able to watch last week as individuals got to present. And I was really curious about how you would put all of that amazing information together uh, for today. And what a great job you've done with that. So thank you very much. Um, there are a few little highlights that we're missing, like, like the winged bird uh, uh, visual there. Um, but generally, you've caught all of it. And I have to say that this presentation is also something easy for the stakeholder to work with going forward. We can take each of those chunks, each of those uh, 
problem solutions, you know, whether it's movement of vehicle traffic or pedestrian access, uh, biodiversity, and you know, any of those sorts of things. Take those chapters, discuss them as a group, you know, how bold or how uh, simple do we want to keep these sorts of solutions? What's a toolbox thing that we could use for a quick fix? versus a long-term investment. It's just beautifully uh, organized and I can't wait to dig into it with our uh, sea level rise, the board of the Watch Hill Conservancy and other uh, interested stakeholders you know, in our community. Um, many of which are here on, um, on the screen uh, today. So if any of you would like to, to uh, pipe in and, and uh, let students know what you think of their work, uh, I, I'm eternally, eternally grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Great. Anyone else before we move on? Okay, that was the 10 second pause, I'm learning how to be comfortable with these longer pauses to let the computer catch up. But <laughs> we'll do last call. <laughs> And it is 1045, so we are five minutes ahead of schedule, which I think gives us a nice buffer to turn the floor over to the um, environmental and natural resource economics students led by Professor Emmy Uchida. So we'll turn it over to Professor Uchida. Thank you to the landscape architects and all the other students so far. Thank you so much, Teresa. So it's always such a tough act to follow going after landscape architecture students because their presentations are always so beautiful and it's just so inspiring. So thank you to all the students in landscape architecture. Um, uh, my class is um, a group of uh, 28 students. Um, so it's a, it's a huge class. Um, they're all very talented uh, seniors. Um, and um, also we have one uh, junior student. So the 28 students divided up into four different teams. Each team um, tackled on an important economic question. Uh, these four questions are interrelated but distinct uh, questions. Um, and hopefully, uh, just like landscape architecture students' um, outputs are useful for uh, the next sort of set of dialogues among the stakeholders, I'm, my hope is that uh, our students' work is also uh, useful in different ways uh, for uh, decision making as well. Uh, before uh, we start the, the presentations, um, I do want to um, uh, thank uh, a lot of people. Um, so uh, thank you um, to all the faculty, uh, teaching assistants and students and other classes for providing critical information um, for our projects. Um, I was thinking that uh, we, have, we have yet to give a lot to other classes, um, but I'm glad that uh, some of the classes were able to pick up uh, the preliminary results from our projects as well. So thanks to our students and thank you to other um, classes as well. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the stakeholders for providing a lot of valuable information, um, uh, including the Watch, Watch Hill Conservancy, uh, Napa Tree Point, um, Tano Westerly, um, and um, other stakeholders involved. Um, so thank you so much for providing a great experience for our students and valuable um, information. Um, and I also would like to ask um, to thank Teresa because she's been um, uh, trying to bring us together and, and um, providing a lot of uh, critical information as well. Um, thank you so much for your support um, throughout the semester. So with that, um, I'd like to start the first presentation. So the first um, presentation will look at the economic impact of um, uh, coastal um, hazards in the future um, and learning from the history. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn to a uh, representative from that team, um, Alana Jones. Uh, Elena, I think you just um, unshared your screen. Do you want to share your screen one more time? Sorry about that. I don't know how to get it into presentation mode. Uh, so uh, you have the box that says present on the right top right hand corner. Sorry, yeah. it wasn't letting me click it. <laughs> Um, hi everyone. So we are part of the environmental natural resource economics portion of the integrated capstone. Um, we were measuring the economic impact of coastal hazards in Watch Hill area. 
And before I get started, I just again want to give a big thank you to all the stakeholders in Watch Hill for providing us with valuable information throughout the project and to our professor, Emmy Uchida, for providing guidance throughout this entire semester for us. So some motivation for our project is looking at the past to understand present and future risk and understanding the magnitude of potential economic impact from coastal storms and also to mitigate potential impacts and take precautionary measures in the face of climate change. So to start off, we decided to look at some historical hurricanes and compare them um, from a past one to a pretty recent one. So for this, we looked at the 1938 New England hurricane, which was one of the most historical hurricanes in this area. Um, it was a category five hurricane and it's estimated economic impact um, for $2019 was estimated to be around $53.6 billion. And from that, we saw a storm, storm surge of about 17 feet. And along with that was a wind speed of 121 miles per hour. And it destroyed about 9,000 homes, but about 12,000 other homes were damaged as well. And it was responsible for about 600 deaths. And then comparing that to the Hurricane Sandy in 2012 for the Northeast area, it did start off as a category three hurricane, but then once it hit landfall, it was downgraded to a tropical storm. Um, the estimated economic impact for that was $70.2 billion. And for this, we estimate it to be more than the 1938 New England hurricane because coastal areas are more developed now in present day than they were in the 1900s. That's our storm surge of 14 feet and a wind speed of 115 miles per hour. So it kind of goes to show that as time goes on and climate change is increasing, that the storm severities are increasing as well. And about 650,000 homes were destroyed and 148 deaths. So our mission statement for our project was estimating and measuring the economic impact of coastal hazards in Watch Hill in the face of climate change and thus motivating these communities to partake in coastal hazard mitigation and the footage on the left is just some footage from the hurricane of 1938. So our methodology getting into this project was our study area of Watch Hill in Rhode Island. We use a time period of May to September, which are the peak tourism months for this area. And we looked at two different scenarios. We did three feet of sea level rise with 100 year storm and then 100 year storm alone. And we were measuring the revenue, tourist jobs lost, as well as any kind of damage cost to the properties. And then we broke this down by residential properties, commercial properties, and any historical sites. So our first scenario is 100 year storm. So the orange and the yellow kind of show where um, the flooding is ending for this type of scenario. So you can see that most of Napa Tree Point is all inundated as well as a lot of Bay Street and Fort Road where a lot of these businesses are. And then our second scenario is three feet of sea level rise plus 100 year storm. And we use storm tools to get both of these um, renderations for this. So this shows that light blue, this area, was the three feet of sea level rise and then any of the orange was 100 year storm flooding. So it just shows that under both scenarios, it, the area is really impacted by inundation. So for the first one, we looked at residential properties for the area. This is under 100 year storm event. So again, we use storm tools to get this. And um, basically it shows that as the 100 year storm and three feet sea level rise are combined, it has a larger impact on the area than a 100 year storm alone. So a lot of these houses um, will be completely inundated or completely damaged by it. So for this, we use storm tools to find the percentage of damage cost for the building. And we multiplied that percentage by the current property value to fund out their damage costs. So some of the largest damage costs we found were on Pawtuck Avenue and Waters Edge Road. So these are just some of the key findings from that study. So again, like I said, under a three foot a sea level rise and 100 year storm scenario, we were seeing a much higher damage cost for those property values around $97 million. So next we looked at tourism and beach revenues at risk. So we looked at some watch hill sites, um, such as bathhouse rentals on the beaches, Carousel, Yacht Club Cabanas, and Yacht Club parking lot. And then we looked at the watch hill fire district budget from 2016, and then we converted it to $2019 to find out their estimated annual revenues for such of these items. So you can see that they range from about $37,000 to almost $130,000.
For the commercial properties, for the number of businesses on this graph, it displays what industries make up the Watch Hill business sector. And the largest industry that makes up the Watch Hill business sector would be retail. And then it's followed by the service and other, which would include retailer companies, the Musquamuck at Boatyard, um, then followed by restaurant, hotel, and then the Yacht Club and Watch Hill Conservancy. And the number of businesses under each industry total to the 46 businesses that were looked at. For our key findings of the commercial properties damage cost, we have both a 100 year storm and a three foot sea level rise with 100 year storm impact scenarios. And for computing the damage cost, as Lana said, we use storm tools to find the building damage percentage under the two different scenarios and then multiplied it by the property value of the business to get the estimated commercial property damage cost. Finding the properties for each of the 46 businesses was done through the Town of Westerly GIS website. Finding the estimated tourism numbers, we used the most recent study on tourism in Rhode Island and looked at the total leisure purpose and broke it down by the number of tourists divided by the number of mun municipalities in Rhode Island divided by the months in a year equals um, equals Y times the time period of the study, which would be three and a half months um, Memorial Day to Labor Day timeframe. For our key findings on tourism, how we broke it down, on estimated number of tourists lost per season, we looked at the tourists from key industries, which are the beach, hotel, restaurants, and retail. We broke that down by then looking at the beach passes sold and the amenities, looking at the number of hotel rooms and overnight stays, looking at the number of tables and rest number of tables at restaurants, and looking at the estimated foot traffic for retail. on the estimated numbers of job loss. The estimated number of job loss are for both a three foot sea level rise with a 100 year storm and a 100 year storm scenario. The estimated number of employees for certain businesses were guesstimates that we are super thankful to have from the Watch Hill Conservancy stakeholders. And as for finding the remaining estimated numbers of employees for each of the businesses, was done by going off of the Watch Hill um, Conservancy stakeholders estimates. Once we calculated each of the individual businesses numbers of employees, we then told it to those numbers for each sector. And for key findings on commercial properties for the tax revenue on total estimated amount of property tax revenue lost per year, we look we took the building damage percentage, again, that we found from storm tools, multiplied that by the tax rate, and then we multiplied that by the property value, which was found on the GIS website. And that gave us the estimated amount of property tax revenue that would be lost for each of the 46 businesses. Then we totaled up again the value that corresponds which e with each of the sectors for a total comparison between the three foot sea level rise with 100 year storm and just 100 year storm. So for the next part of the tourism industry, we looked at the beaches in Watch Hill. We focused primarily on the four main beaches. So Napa Tree Point Beach, Watch Hill Association Beach, Ocean House Beach and East Beach. Under both scenarios, um, three of the four beaches do have 100% inundation rates. The only one that didn't was Watch Hill Association Beach, which ranged from 14 to 20% inundation. So then some key findings of the beaches um, were our estimated loss of beach value per season. So we used uh, from a previous study done by the EPA for beaches in Massachusetts, we had to find the beachgoers willingness to pay for a beach day. So that's their travel to get there, if they spend any money on lunches, all the things included in having a traditional beach day. And that was estimated to be about $22 a person a day. So we included that number with any kind of parking rates, uh, beach entry fees, if the beach has any kind of amenities such as camping or cabana rentals or beach chair rentals, anything like that. 
to get these estimated values. So the Watch Hill Beach Association does have the highest estimated loss of beach value per season because it is a privatized beach. So their entry fees and all the other fees related to it are quite high. So that's around $5 million. And Napa Tree Point was the lowest because it is um, just a nature conservancy. So it doesn't have any kind of entry fees. It is free to the public, um, but that does still have some kind of loss. And then next we looked at historical sites. So the main historical site in Watch Hill is the Flying Horse Carousel. This was built in 1876 and it's listed as one of Rhode Island's National Historic Landmarks. It is the oldest operational carousel in the U.S. and it was originally part of a traveling carnival and then abandoned in Watch Hill in the late 1800s. So it really holds a lot of historical value to this area. So for this it has both an estimated market value and an estimated non-market value. So its market value um, brings in about $37,000 in annual revenue, and this is found from its fee, which is $2 a ride, and then multiplied by the number of horses on a carousel, as well as how many um, people ride the carousel. Its non-market value is something that um, is usually a person's willingness to pay to keep that site, to not have it be damaged by a storm. So it, it has a higher, um, has a higher cost usually than the market value because it does have that kind of historical significance that you can't really put a number to. So to find this, we would recommend conducting a direct intercept survey to parents waiting at the carousel to find their non-market market value for it to see how willing they are to keep that in the area. So some conclusions from our project are larger estimated economic impact is found under a three feet of sea level rise and 100 year storm scenario. And then the retail and service industries will take some of the biggest hits when it comes to loss in property taxes and damage costs because they are some of the larger industries for Watch Hill's business sector. And then the estimated number of tourists expected to decline by 35% per season under this scenario. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Alana and Alex. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to um, uh, open up for any questions. We have a couple of minutes um, to take several questions. All right, Pete August. <laughs> Great job, guys. Very, very, very interesting. Bravo to you. Um, Hurricane Sandy hit in kind of deep fall. What is, what is the, the, the seasonal timing of a big storm? How impactful is that on your economic estimates? So for this project in particular, we only looked at the peak tourism months for Watch Hill. So it was from Memorial Day to Labor Day. We know that Hurricane Sandy did hit in October. It was kind of later in the hurricane season, which as climate change increases, it is expected to kind of see a trend in hurricanes occurring later or kind of off schedule. Um, so that we didn't really take into consideration for this, even though we did recognize that. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, um, so um, I'd like to move on uh, to our next presentation. So um, regardless of the exact numbers in terms of um, losses in jobs or losses in uh, potential revenue, those numbers are gonna be quite substantial and really important to think about for um, Watch Hill. Um, the next presentation um, is going to consider three different strategies, um, that uh, some of which are um, you, we've already heard through um, other classes. Um, and um, the next presentation will be looking at cost effectiveness of those three um, strategies. So um, at this point, I'd like to turn to uh, Shana um, and um, uh, start off uh, our presentation. Hi everybody. Um, so my team was responsible for conducting a cost benefit analysis of three different coastal resilience methods. Um, our team members were myself, Nick, 
Brandon, Samantha, Emily, Justin, and Brianna. Um, okay, so the motivation for this project, we looked at the most cost effective and efficient strategy um, for Watch Hill to combat the climate change and sea level rise in the area. Um, so a cost benefit analysis looks at the economic side of things with the cost and the benefits weighing out. Um, we're making sure the stakeholders um, sort of uh, get the best strategy possible. The, the stakeholders um, are able to see the different um, alternatives side by side, so it's easy to see which one's a clear winner. Um, so the CBA provides a framework for analyzing the data in, in a monetary way. It yields um, the net benefit of an investment, allowing for direct comparison of similar and dissimilar projects. It also shows uh, the worth of the proposal uh, relative to the project. And um, it shows if you weren't to, if you didn't implement anything, the difference between that um, monetarily and not. Um, the alternatives are easily ranked side by side um, in terms of maximizing the net present value. Um, so for ours, for the coastal resilience methods, we looked at gray infrastructure, green infrastructure, and retreat options to see which one's the best for Watch Hill. Um, um, and we were able to look at these all side by side and um, weigh out the costs and benefits for these. So our first alternative is the use of gray infrastructure. Um, our proposal here is to construct um, a higher seawall along the Watch Hill Cove area. Um, some of the costs for our project include the current seawall removal. So currently there's a short little seawall along this cove that would need to be removed so we could update um, the infrastructure. Any materials, labor, and construction costs of the new seawall and a small yearly maintenance fee that includes cleaning or patching up any damage that may occur. We have some significant benefits from increasing this seawall. Um, you do save a lot of tourism revenue from avoiding um, the damages from these storm events. So as you can see in this picture, a lot of most of Bay Street and Fort Road um, will be affected in a hundred year storm event scenario, as well as a good portion of some parking lot areas being affected by a regular three feet sea level rise scenario. So by building up the seawall, our goal would be to protect these areas a little bit more. So this is kind of where the proposed area of the seawall will be. Um, it will stretch along Watch Hill Cove to the entrance of the Napa Tree Conservation Area because building on that conservation area is not really an option. It will be about 0.3 miles in length, 9.8 feet tall with 12 inch thickness. And we came up with these numbers by kind of looking at a lot of other studies, um, such as an area in New Jersey that was affected by Hurricane Sandy and the seawall they implemented there. So this is just a ground view of what the seawall might look like and where it will be. Um, right here is just a street view of a parking lot on Fort Road and the seawall will be along this cove right here. Um, and we're hoping that this could look a little bit like what we have going on in Narragansett right now. So you have the um, boulders kind of coming out, protruding from the um, water's edge. And then you have a seawall here with pedestrian walkways. And so you still have that ab ability to view the ocean. So the green infrastructure alternative involves working with the natural features such as the dunes, salt marshes, and seagrass in Watch Hill to improve the flood, flood risk mitigation in both a three foot sea level rise and a hundred year storm event. 
And our CBA was conducted by gathering the costs and monetizing the benefits associated with these nature-based resiliency methods. Natural defenses are important and beneficial in mitigating the threats associated with climate change because they provide specific ecosystem services, which help to create long-term change in the coastal environment. And these are the specific costs and benefits that we use to find our net present values and our cost benefit analysis for both the three foot sea level rise and the 100 year storm scenario. Our costs involved salt marsh, salt marsh restoration, seagrass restoration, and dune restoration, which includes the project itself, conducting it with the labor and all of the maintenance costs. And the benefits include the reduced impact of inundation, the recreational benefits of the area, the existence value of the habitat and the, species, and the species that are important and valuable to the area, and also the carbon offset of implementing all of these green infrastructure to the area. And this map from Storm Tools displays the inundation from both a 100-year storm event and three feet of sea level rise, and I use the feature on storm tools to outline the affected areas that we focused on specifically to find the total area in acres that we used for our focus to conduct our CBA. So the third methodology is retreat, which involves detaching a structure from its foundation, raising it with jacks, um, placing it on a wheeled vehicle, and moving it to a different location. Our costs are as follows, structural relocation, which is the um, cost per square foot of the structure. I got these numbers from a contractor that is, they're called riggers. Um, new site preparation as well, which is paired with uh, new site utilities. And when you move the buildings, the old site needs to be restored as well. Um, we got these numbers through a contractor in Westerly, and we also have the cost of permitting to do all this work, as well as the lost revenue of the new site, which is proposed to be the Larkin parking lot area. The benefits are strictly the value of the structures and all they entail, as well as the business and coastal tourism they provide the aesthetics, as well as the Ninigrit statue, which is in the flood zone. And we also have the opportunity of lower flood insurance. This is our structural relocation first location that we've analyzed. It's the Bay Street and Fort Road retail and residential condominiums. This is a side-by-side -side comparison between the three-foot sea level rise and the Google Maps photo. It shows you just the yellow area here, which is the shops that were inundated. And this is the Larkin parking lot highlighted for future reference. So this is the second structural relocation area. Um, these are the retail and residential condos and an integrate statue. Again, this is a side-by-side -side comparison with the yellow box. These are the addresses 5, 11, 13, 25, 27, 29, 31 Bay Street. And it's at the fork of Sunset and 1, 101 Ave. For the 100 year storm scenario, we used one other location by Sunset Ave. This was restricted by the size of our relocation site. So we acquired a few residential houses as well. So where are we gonna put these buildings? As I said before, the Larkin parking lot is very key in our analysis here. It has a acreage of 0.89 acres, which is around 38,000 square feet. Um, all our structures are fit to form in this location. Some of our assumptions were that these structures have the ability and integrity to be moved 
whether it's fitting down the street or the structure that they are built from. Um, this is also owned by the Watch Hill Fire District, as noted before, and a possible satellite parking system, as said by another student, is a great proposal as well, if we do decide to move these buildings. So looking at the net present values of these three alternatives, um, net present value is just the value to the stakeholders of doing this project. If you have a positive net present value, it means you should go through with this project. This project has significant benefit to you. A negative net present value would mean um, that you should go back and reconsider the project and not go through with it at that time. As you can see, all of our alternatives had a positive net present value. Um, the highest being in a three foot sea level rise scenario between green and gray infrastructure. Um, initially, we had thought that it would come out this way, and we think that um, for stakeholders, it would be most beneficial to kind of use a combination between green and gray infrastructure in order to um, come up with the best solution against three foot sea level rise and a hundred year storm event in the Watch Hill area. Um, the um, net present value of these came out to be around $15 million just because of the tourism revenue and this avoided damages. For the retreat scenario, the 100 year storm event was uh, a lot higher value because of the value of the residential homes, which are very nice and very valuable. The In terms of the three foot scenario, it was about half at $7.9 million net present value. So we have a, a discrepancy there, but it still needs to be evaluated. So these are just the references where we got all of our information from. Um, you can talk to Samantha with any questions. Um, thank you to everybody who helped us with this project. We had a lot of collaboration with Ocean Engineering as well as the other students in the Henry Capstone class. So thank you guys for that. All right, thank you uh, so much to everyone and the team um, for putting the presentations together. So um, I, I um, would like to open up for questions, but before that, I just want to briefly mention that um, the students are preparing a short presentation for today. And um, obviously there is a lot of work behind each of these slides, um, lots of spreadsheet, lots of parameters, um, and lots of um, assumptions as well. So if you'd like to learn more about uh, what these scenarios are about, um, where the best uh, costs and benefits came from, um, uh, please uh, join us on Friday um, or uh, watch the recordings from um, our Friday's longer presentations for each of these projects. Okay, with that, um, uh, Shana, do you mind um, unsharing your uh, screen um, so that I can take a look at anyone who might be raising their hand? So uh, I'd like to um, take a few questions. We have just a couple of minutes. Oh, go ahead, Jocelyn. Thank you. Um, I, I, that was great. I think that it's really important to consider, you know, obviously the, the cost of all of these things. And, you know, as one of the stakeholders in this process with the conservancy, um, that matters. And so it's nice to see that in a visual way. Something that I am interested in, curious about, is almost sort of combining the, both of those pr presentations. And so, so there is a cost to doing nothing. Um, and how does that compare to the cost of all of these other options? And, um, you know, maybe there isn't a net positive in that, but I think that it could be nice to show that in a presentation, I guess. And that's, that's really my only comment. I think you did a wonderful job and thank you for um, pulling that all together. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, does anyone from um, that team want to tackle this question? Yeah, so we ended up calculating a little bit about um, damages and kind of what would happen if we did do nothing. Um, I was calculating a loss of life that would be associated with a hundred year storm and property value that would go under um, and be destroyed with that. That came out to around um, 15 and a half million. Um, so it, there would be a significant um, 
cost to doing nothing. Yep. So uh, great answer, um, Shana. So just to add to what she just said, um, the way cost benefit takes into account is um, uh, prevented damages. So that actually comes into the benefit side of the CBA. Yeah, along that same line, I just want to, um, I, I circled avoided damages um, and then sort of drew an arrow back up to Pete's question from the first group about, you know, if a storm hits after the peak tourism season, um, it seemed like there's a good relationship between planning and, and investing in infrastructure that results in avoided damages. And I guess a, a logical next question would be, how does that investment relate to the tourism season for the following season. So if we get hit with a storm in the fall, late fall, when it's not peak tourism season, but you've made some, you know, adaptations to avoid damage, how does that show the flow and the consistency of the tourism industry for follow the following seasons? And I, I so I'm, I think, you know, pondering that a little bit more, I'll be interested to talk, think about that more before Friday's um, full presentation. So thank you for that. Great question. Um, do you guys want to tackle this question? Um, anyone from that team? Yeah, I didn't really frame it in the form of a question, but I think, you know, if you can follow on maybe the thought of, of Pete's question with avoided damages in play for tourism. Sure. Um, just want to ask a clarification question. So um, to the cost benefit analysis team. So what's the time horizon you're, you're thinking about? Is it 30 years or 100 years or what, what, what's the time horizon? We're looking at a 30 year time horizon. Okay, yeah. So what would happen, um, Teresa, is that um, the way the impact um, appears on, on the co cost and benefit would, um, it would change uh, the timing of those costs and benefits um, or, uh, over the 30 years. But that, that's a great question. And um, it's, I think it might be worth considering a sensitivity analysis based on the timing of um, when the storm would hit. Um, okay, all right, thank you um, so much. Um, so um, uh, the next question, so as Jocelyn mentioned, a lot of these um, uh, options are costly. Um, there's cost of doing nothing, but each of these strategies um, are costly as well. So our next team is looking at different financing options for uh, Watch Hill District to see what are some of the available options and uh, what kinds of projects they'd be appropriate for. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn to um, Alex and Ricky. Hang on, sorry, give me a second. <laughs> I accidentally closed the screen. <laughs> no worries. Okay, should have it now. All right. And hopefully everyone can see this. Uh, yes. And go ahead, Ricky. All right, uh, thank you to everybody here for uh, sticking around. We're almost through them, so appreciate your patience. Uh, my name is Ricky, and my fellow group members are Alex, Brendan, Brian, Chris, Jack, and Minnie, and together we are the Resilience Financing Team. So um, first we'd like to go over what is the motivation behind our, our project, and obviously we know that um, the case here in Watch Hill is um, being a coastal community, they're susceptible to sea level rise. Right now in the short term, um, that can bring some damage to local structures that are close to the water, especially within um, three feet right now. And left untreated in the long term, it could be um, catastrophic and, uh, you know, as we've seen, go over the road and damage even more property. So um, the, the point here is we want to see um, what is, uh, you know, the best option for stakeholders, what's the most cost effective and what's really possible 
as a financing option to help them, um, you know, create a project. So our goal is which one would be, what would be a viable financing option for the uh, community of Washill and its stakeholders. And uh, we want to use the most of investment capital to be used towards resilience projects and provide a recommendation of which option to use and how to use it. So um, together we have found uh, five financing options. Obviously you can see here there's more than five options, but um, oh, they are catastrophe bonds, resilience bonds, two types of taxes, one on just the fire district and as the uh, town of Westerly all itself. Um, property assessed resilience system, which is um, kind of the uh, little sibling of resilience bond, and, um, insurance and donations. And as you can see in this table, um, they all have their own different environment. Some of them are more of a large scale project, some of them are, scale, are small scale, individual versus community wide and resilience are disaster, so more reactive or proactive um, projects. So we're gonna go in ahead and turn over to Alex to talk a little bit about some of them. Okay, so the, uh, the first um, strategy is, uh, Ricky just mentioned, is a catastrophe bond that we looked into. And essentially uh, what a catastrophe bond does is it provides funds for disaster recovery uh, to a town or a city that uh, sponsors the bond. So I have a diagram here to show the general structure of what it would look like. You can see that there are three, uh, three partners involved in the uh, bond. You have the issuer of the bond, which is typically the um, insurance company. Uh, you have investors who um, invest a principal into the bond and you have the sponsor or co-sponsors, which are typically uh, the town or city and uh, the most at risk uh, utilities, the utility companies, and they pay uh, typically annual premiums into the bond. And the way it works is um, there's a set trigger event, uh, say a hundred year storm, and it, over the course of the bond, if the storm were to happen, then the payout kept by the issuer uh, is given to the sponsor and co-sponsors, depending on their premiums and that is used to fund the recovery and disaster relief. Uh, if there is no storm, that's where the investors essentially uh, get their return on their investment, and they get the principal that they initially paid plus interest plus the uh, payments, uh, of the, the premium payments from the sponsors. So it's kind of a high risk scenario for the investors. <clears throat> Uh, but essentially, we've uh, said that the catastrophe bond isn't exactly the best uh, strategy because it doesn't really have any um, uh, options for financing resilience projects in themselves. It's just disaster relief. Um, so we essentially said that this is uh, best used as a, an emergency plan for um, disaster recovery. Uh, but we then looked at resilience bonds, which is essentially a catastrophe bond, but improved uh, a 2.0 version, if you will. So the resilience bond takes the same structure as the catastrophe bond with the investors, issuer, and sponsors. Um, but in this case, some payment from the premiums and some payment from the principal are put into a resilience rebate by the insurance company, who then gives that to the sponsor and co-sponsors to fund proposed resilience infrastructure projects that then in turn reduce the risk of the catastrophe event uh, damaging the assets of the town and that reduces the risk to investors investments so it's kind of a win-win uh, for all the parties involved so this is essentially just a hypothetical scenario um, i'm not going to go too in depth with it but just to give you an idea of what this would look like this is these numbers are obviously for a larger uh, city um, but scaled down, the concept remains the same. So you can kind of see that the city uh, would have normally the lowest uh, risk of assets, um, followed by the utility companies, which would have more. And when this happens, you can see that in the uh, top left box, um, the, the, the amount that they sponsor into the bond varies depending on their risk. So then the city puts the least amount of money into the bond, followed by the electric, then the water, then the transit in this scenario, uh, based on their uh, predicted risk. <clears throat> so 
next we have um, a, the uh, tax option for um, Watch Hill itself, or we can also see this as the uh, smaller tax option. And we based it out over the um, next one to 20 years. Um, for those, I'm not sure if everyone can see, blue is one year, orange is 10 years, and gray is 20 years. Uh, yearly collections in the district are about just over 1.1 million with a max um, percentage raise of 2%. And um, here we can see that uh, we're, we're going to be using half a percent for most of the baseline of what we're talking about in taxes. So a half a percent uh, increase would result up to about uh, $60,000 in revenue over um, 10 years. Next slide, please. So as we can see, um, as a smaller option, there's not as much funds to go around. But if we were to use a little bit more, as you can see at the bottom, more so of the 10 or 20 year span, um, we have uh, more money to go around. And um, that gives us about $230,000. So with that much money, we are um, anticipating a possible project for the area would be a Napa Tree Dune restoration project, estimating about exactly that much cost. Uh, this project is based on a similar project done in Florida that um, was looking to increase about 40 feet of vegetation um, for their their dune restoration project. And um, this project is viable because the area is a bit too expensive for another project such as dredging, but um, still gets pretty much the exact same point across of dune restoration and the focus on the vegetation. So can I um, climb that wall? and uh, get it to the shoreline is easy. Uh, next slide, please. So a little more um, uh, higher scale would be a, a tax on the entire town of West Chile. And um, we, once again, we did one, five, 10 and 15 in 20 years. Uh, currently it's about 74 and a half million in tax revenue. And if we go with that same baseline again, with the half percentage, we can see that it would be about $1.8 million after uh, five years. Next slide, please. So more of a larger scale project. Um, and as you can see, we have already seen um, some other groups talk about this in the other previous projects, but um, a, a project of that magnitude, we could probably look more upwards into a project of about $2.6 million where we would suggest um, maybe something such as a bile swale project. And our suggestion would be able to put this on um, Wikipog Road. Uh, and our main rationale behind this is because it is an evacuation road and is in the heart of the, uh, the, the damage area as we've seen um, throughout the day on um, storm tools. Um, essentially, um, yeah, and just essentially that would cover up to about 3000 feet. And um, yes, so now I'll turn it over to Minnie for insurance. It, um, so for insurance, it's usually optional for a mortgage homeowner in what are normally considered low-risk areas. But in the case of Watch Hill, is located in a high-risk zone, uh, meaning that flood insurance is required for homeowners. Um, so flood insurance will provide money to repair or even rebuild a home if it's damaged or destroyed by flooding. It can be purchased through a local insurance agent or with the National Flood Insurance Program Servicing Agent. And to the table to the right um, is the available insurance coverage, which is broken down into three different categories. One being residential, one to four family, um, next being other residential, and the third one is non-residential, which is essentially um, a commercial scale projects. Um, these insurance coverage is broken up by two different um, types of programs, one being emergency program, and the other one is um, regular program. Um, next is the community rating system. It's a program that administered by FEMA to provide lower insurance um, premiums under the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, it is rated by 10 classes and the reduction based on points value um, assigned from community implemented activities. And the activities credit provide um, a direct benefit to the community um, as currently Westerly, Westerly is rated in class eight and has saved over 200 thousand dollars per community and the table to the right also just so like show the percentage of discounts for different classes um, <clears throat> next is the hazard mitigation assistance uh, there are three different types 
um, of grant programs and the main purpose of um, hazard mitigation assistance is to encourage actions that are long-term cost effective and environmentally friendly um, and it reduces loss of life and, pro and property by lessens the impact of disasters. So the three main um, grant programs are hazard mitigation grant programs, um, pre-disaster uh, mitigation, and lastly, flood mitigation assistance. And uh, to the right, these are just the two examples of the previous grants award, award um, for different type of activities um, has been granted in the past. And um, lastly, the last table on the bottom just shows the um, agency that can um, apply for the grant programs. Uh, so the um, so they have to apply on behalf of the property or the business owner. So the in individual property owners are not to contact the state like regarding the applications or awards. So these are the four types um, of agency that could apply on behalf of the town. Um, these are two examples that um, of the project that's worked with the Hazard Mitigation Assistant or the National Flood Insurance Program that have been successful in the past, one being Ballin County, um, Alabama. Um, they've worked with FEMA to complete the HMGP project to elevate the home. They utilize the ICC funds to cover the non-federal share and maintain flood insurance until more is paid off. Um, the other one is Sandy Hope Bay, New Jersey. Um, they were required to elevate their home to obtain the permits at a second floor for $22,000. Um, um, they decided to elevate above the requirement from 60 to 77 inches. And they have also installed vents and elevated utilities. So flood insurance can indirectly reduce the investment in risk reduction prior to the disaster through provisions of risk information and through premium discount of hazard mitigation. So the last option is <clears throat> donations. And um, donations are important for, they can add as a complement or stand as their own financing option. Uh, really depends on the scale of the other fin financing options or resilience projects that the community would be uh, moving forward with. Um, and this is because a donation could be a large scale or small scale. Um, the third, three main examples of donations, um, the first being a federal grant or a national donation such as the Wildlife and Fisheries Department. Um, there's an example of um, in Alabama where there's almost a million dollars raised for uh, flood relief there. The second one would be um, about a, a community um, awareness such as Narragansett Save the Bay Foundation. Um, so that's where a community can gather together and um, have proceeds go to a certain cause. And the last one would be kind of an individual um, standpoint. And I'll go to that in the next slide, um, where we believe that would probably be the best option for um, Westerly and Watch Hill. And what I mean by individual, I mean um, essentially a, a GoFundMe page or where an individual, whether it be themselves or the face of a large organization, kind of um, starts the funding process on their own. And for those who don't know, a GoFundMe page is essentially a platform where um, you can post online about whatever event you're trying to raise money for. You give a little brief description and then uh, it's pretty much global. Anybody who sees it has the opportunity to send money in. And um, it'd be a great way to um, raise awareness for things such as sea level rise or um, disaster relief, et cetera. So like I said, it can be coupled very well with another project. So to conclude, um, most options are um, pretty pretty much a great option, I would say, for Watch Hill. But a lot of them, as we said in the beginning, are different scales. For example, a small-scale project, uh, tax increase to the fire district, and more of an individual base on the insurance and donations would work. But it wouldn't be as good if we were looking at a large-scale project, which would more so require a resilience bond, a tax for overall of Westerly, and, a, and, um, uh, and, and overall insurance rebate as well. Our recommendation would be to utilize a combination of all of the financing options, obviously probably more so excluding the catastrophe bond, um, and um, picking and choosing what would work specifically the best for the community and the stakeholders involved. So as the references, contact Minnie if um, there's all alternate information requested.
Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Ricky, and um, the rest of the team. Um, thanks very much for a great presentation. So um, I'd like to open up for uh, one or two questions. Dave Walsh. I have a question. Hello, everybody. I'm the director of the Coastal Resources Center, and um, I was a former resident of a community on the Outer Banks, and uh, one of the strategies that our community used was um, hotel occupancy tax, as well as um, municipal service districts, sort of variable tax rates across the community. And uh, through those different mechanisms, uh, they've been able to fund, we funded a $40 million uh, bond basically for uh, building, a, for doing a beach nourishment project. So I was just curious if you thought about variable tax rates spatially and maybe other ways to get revenue, you know, sort of use their revenue to uh, pay for green or other types of projects. Thanks. Yes, um, we actually did look into a, a, a variety of different tax options. Um, one other one that we were looking into for a long time was a groundwater tax due to a lot of like impermeable sources. And we figured since Watch Hill is essentially a hill, and there would be a lot of runoff um, that also could be an option as well. We found a couple different um, models from around the country where it worked, such as in Philadelphia and Seattle, I believe. So there are a lot of models nationally where it's already been implemented. Um, so yes, but um, I appreciate um, that information as well, but because um, there are a lot of different ways you can go with the taxing option too. Maybe, maybe I could just add one additional comment, which is on the variable rate. You, you mentioned the proposal of taxing all of Westerly, and, and you might imagine that some people that maybe are not proximal to the area of the improvement, they, they might not be as thrilled to get the same tax rate as someone that's maybe more proximal. So the, what the community did was they basically, for, for the beach nourishment, they waterfront homes and like the first row or two of homes were taxed at a much higher rate than the, the greater community. Now the greater community is still getting a benefit, of course, by having improved beaches and so on. So that was the philosophy. Everybody should maybe have an increase in the tax, but maybe adjust the rate a little bit spatially. So something to think about for um, maybe a more substantial tax for bigger, bigger projects. I see Grant Simmons is unmuted. I imagine you have something to say, Grant. Welcome. Uh, yeah. My question is that do you see any uh, potential federal funding going to states um, you know maybe after we get through all of this virus and all the spending that we're currently doing but um, for this type of resiliency work um, coming from the federal government in in large in large funding for really distressed areas that's my question thank you and you guys are doing a great job by the way this has been a very very informative so Grant, thank could you, you just introduce yourself for the benefit of the students and sort of your role in the community because you wear a lot of hats. Uh, yeah, I'm, um, I've, I've, I've been involved with the Watch Hill Conservancy for a whole bunch of years now. Um, I was the Watch Hill Fire District's Parks Commissioner, which is responsible for the land owned by the Watch Hill Fire District, uh, which involves Napa Tree and all of the areas which we've been discussing. So this is very near and dear to me um, because we've been looking at flooding scenarios and, and how to deal with this, this ongoing uh, problem and what to face going forward and, and what the future will look like. And all of your studies and all the information you're bringing to us right now actually drills home to the property owners and the stakeholders about how significant uh, this work we're doing right now and how it will affect our future. So. Again, thank you so very, very much. Um, this has been most informative. It's been a very fast um, two and a half, three hours. So I've been thoroughly enjoyed it. And hopefully we'll be able to kind of round this back up um, and we can maybe give a larger presentation to the community uh, through the Conservancy. So thank you. Thanks. So back to Grant's question about federal Say that just quickly again, Grant, sorry. <laughs> I was wondering whether or not what the outlook was for federal funding flowing to states and then the states allocating back to, to municipalities and, and to, into small fire districts like us. Uh, I mean, I, you, you want to go? 
Okay, I, I was just gonna say, um, I mean, I think it's, I think that's a very hard factor to predict, uh, especially now. I mean, it always depends. I mean, we, again, we have a, we have a presidential election coming up and so that, and you, there's gonna be uh, like, who knows how the political climate's gonna look in uh, like, you know, in a few months. Um, it, it could it could change in a variety of ways. I know, and it's uh, it's also hard to predict um, after this whole uh, the whole pandemic crisis kind of uh, comes to uh, somewhat of a conclusion. Uh, there's probably going to be a big shift uh, from many different uh, uh, funding areas to uh, health. Uh, health services and things like that afterwards I, I mean obviously right now there is too but even after like just uh, the political climate is definitely gonna have a big shift in that direction I, I would I would think um, uh, but you know it also there could also be a, a big storm that happens that could also shift those kinds of uh, funds so it's definitely a hard thing to predict but I think that um, uh, there's definitely there's definitely a future uh, where I can see it, especially with the increasing climate changes. Uh, I can see more funding going in that direction um, in the future. All Great. Right. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Alex. Um, okay, so um, in interest of time, um, I'd like to move on to the final presentation. So um, the the last uh, project is going to take a look at public preferences. So um, as um, we looked at various economic aspects, um, what the public thinks about different options um, for Watts Hills future is going to be important. So um, our last uh, project will um, uh, has conducted a survey with the stakeholders in Watts Hill and will present the results we have so far. Okay, so I'd like to turn to uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, I think Frank's going to share it. Oh, um, one second. Uh, oh, sorry. Having a little issue here with Zoom. Um, do you see the share screen button on the in the? Um, yeah, it's having me do something in my uh, preferences. Um, Uh, did that work? No. No. Um, let yeah. me hit share screen one more time. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that worked. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. All right. All righty. All right. So um, we are. Our team's main goal was to find the economic value of preserving Watch Hill. Uh, the team members are Abby, Brooke, myself, uh, Samantha, Kaylee, Francisco, Frank, and uh, Jeremy. So as we've been discussing all morning, uh, climate change is increasing both the intensity and frequency of storms. And uh, that, that's uh, sig significantly contributing to a lot of these issues in Watch Hill. And since we are dealing with limited resources, as we usually are, um, we used a survey method to sort of get the uh, town's preferences of the Watch Hill Conservancy's preferences on what they value and what they would like to try to preserve. So um, we had the uh, valuable tool of uh, Storm Tools software. And uh, what that was able to do was uh, provide us sort of a uh, screenshot of uh, the areas uh, within Watch Hill that would um, be uh, subjected to risk from uh, increased uh, storm intensity, storm frequency, and uh, most importantly, sea level rise. Um, what we're looking at here is a model of uh, projected three feet of sea level rise within Watch Hill. 
and uh, we can see that uh, a large area of uh, historic Watch Hill would be uh, severely impacted. So um, our objectives uh, here were to understand the public preferences uh, within Watch Hill and uh, what uh, Watch Hill's residents uh, prefer to preserve, um, whether it's uh, natural or historic assets, um, and to uh, determine uh, how residents of Watch Hill perceive their risk to um, sea level rise and climate change, um, storm, increased storm intensity and storm frequency, and uh, how much residents might be willing to pay to avoid uh, these damages to Watch Hill. So the way that we went about doing this is, as we mentioned, it's a survey uh, for stated preferences. And we used the Qualtrics software, which was a great, great, super helpful in getting, allowing us to not only construct the survey, but compile the information. And uh, the survey was open from April 18th to April 22nd, and uh, was sent out to roughly 50 members of the Watch Hill Fire District and Conservancy, Watch Hill Conservancy and we obtained 38 viable responses that you'll see represented further on. And uh, moving on to a lot of our, some of our survey results. So, so um, these two graphs here represent uh, some of the demographics of uh, the respondents to our survey. Um, one of them, one of our questions was um, how long uh, the respondents had lived within Watch Hill. Um, as you can see, we had a varying uh, number of responses. Um, and we also asked a question um, about our respondents' uh, education level um, to kind of gauge the, uh, the education level of the, uh, the people taking um, our survey. And we have a large uh, variety here. Um, we also um, asked some questions about perceived risk. Uh, for example, we asked how worried um, are you about the uh, risk of a flood to your home over the next 10 years? Um, we provided a scale uh, from zero to 10, where zero meant not worried at all, and 10 meaning very worried, and asked uh, the respondents to uh, where they perceive their risk. Um, another question that we included was, uh, how do we, we asked the, uh, what they think the probability is that a 100 year storm event will occur within the next 10 years. Uh, we also gave them uh, a list of probability ranges from zero to 100 and asked them to um, give us their perceived risk. So this uh, graph right here is a representation of the first bullet point on the last slide uh, with the 1 to 10 scale of how worried uh, the perception, how worried they are of flood risk. And as you can see, it is more so concentrated towards the bottom end, but there are you know, quite a few people up on the higher end as well. And this, this graph right here represents um, how, what the perception of risk that a flood event will cause damage to either the participant's home or business or others' homes or businesses in the community. As you can see, most of them said that, yes, they are worried about some sort of flooding event causing damages. Uh, we asked other questions about um, measures that re uh, respondents to the survey had taken um, in the past to help mitigate um, these damages uh, from sea level rise and storms. And uh, we see that um, about half, almost half of uh, the respondents have taken some measures um, to mitigate the risks from uh, storms and sea level rise. So um, we look at some of the steps that they've taken and we notice that um, most people uh, have moved essential items from the first floor, maybe moving water heaters up to secondary levels of structures or raising the structure itself. Uh, while you know there were other options and some people chose those instead. So then we moved on from there to present uh, three different uh, scenarios to prevent sea level, uh, sea level rise or to mitigate it, which I think most of them you've seen already today. Um, the first of which being uh, bioswales mentioned by the landscape architecture uh, group, which I'd have to give uh, Spencer a shout out for creating these little graphics for us. And uh, that basically consists of a channel 
designed to concentrate and convey storm water while removing debris and pollution, and they have high success rates for daily flooding. And we also have the second one, managed retreat, which just include, it, uh, may include moving infrastructure and buildings along Bay Street further away from the coast so that they're uh, further away from areas that are likely to get flooded. Um, our third option was upgrading the uh, existing seawall. So uh, seawalls are on shore structures. Uh, they prevent overtopping and flooding of land. And um, the proposed uh, uh, project here would be to reinforce or build upon the existing seawall. Uh, so here uh, we asked our respondents uh, to suppose the fire district in Watch Hill uh, was considering these strategies uh, to make the district more resilient to sea level rise and future coastal storms. So um, we asked uh, if our respondents would be willing to contribute in the form of an increase to their po uh, property tax in order to fund these resiliency projects. So the way that the willingness to pay questions were set up in Qualtrics were essentially uh, the question that Frank just posed, if they were to answer yes to that, they would be redirected to a randomized set of values that would, uh, as long as they continue to agree to the set of values, it would keep stepping them up to a higher value until they hit the cap, which was $500. And if they were to say no, to the initial property tax increase, they would be redirected to a question as to why not, essentially. So this graph here uh, represents uh, the positive responses to um, our um, annual increased property tax um, amount. So essentially, uh, like Chris was saying, as you uh, stepped up on the scale, um, depending on how you answered, uh, your questions. Um, what we did was we took the uh, positive responses and uh, kind of set up a demand curve here where um, you can see that um, most people were willing to pay uh, up to, you know, $300. And then uh, from there, it started to taper off uh, a little bit, but uh, most people were willing uh, to contribute in some form to um, so like supply funds for these uh, resiliency projects within Watch Hill. And, uh, oh, could you go back to that real yes, quick? Yes, sorry. So uh, as you can see on the bottom there, based on the responses, uh, the positive responses, we had 23 individuals who completed this portion and didn't say no to the uh, property tax increase. And the average willingness to pay amongst those people who did say yes was $469.50. Thank you. Um, so this, what this graph here represents is uh, the maximum willingness to pay per price point. So uh, what you'll notice is to the left for $50, $100, and $200, we have no information there. Uh, that's because everyone who um, participated in this part of the survey was willing to pay at least $50, $100, or $200 um, to fund these resiliency projects. Uh, when you see 9% uh, above $300, that is 9% uh, of the respondents. Um, that was their maximum willingness to pay. So 9% uh, uh, would be willing to pay uh, no more than 300 and then that continues up. Uh, so we see that uh, about 72% of the respondents who took this portion of the survey were willing to pay at least $500 annually. Um, and increased property tax uh, in order to fund resiliency projects within Watch Hill. So as you can see here, what we've done is uh, sort of take two different variables and compare them together. You have the willingness to pay up the y-axis, and then you have uh, how long that the residents have lived in Watch Hill on the x-axis. And as you can see, there's a bit of a, you know, uh, spread amongst them and then you'll as you'll notice there are a few along the bottom line and those are uh, the zero line and that represents essentially people who said no to the willingness to pay question and this graph right here is we structured another question in the survey similarly to this pertaining to just maintaining the flying horse carousel and as you can see, as, as the number value goes up, the number of participants that are willing to pay that amount is going down. And based on, we had 16 positive responses, which was around half of the entire survey. And their average willingness to pay was $306.25. 
So here, um, this is just another illustration of the maximum willingness to pay per price point. Um, so as we can see, compared to uh, Watch Hill as a, uh, as a whole, um, respondents were less likely um, to be willing to pay for resiliency projects uh, just to support the flying horse carousel. Um, we can see that the, the numbers vary here, uh, but most people would, the, the largest portion, 31% uh, uh, would be roughly willing to pay $400 uh, increase, um, and that's their maximum willingness to pay. But as you can see, um, it is very varied. Um, sorry, uh, you guys need to wrap up in 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, as you can see here, this is a breakdown of which plan they prefer, a 30 year or a 100 year plan? Uh, this here is um, the pro uh, project preference. Uh, so this is uh, based on those three projects uh, that we, uh, we presented. Um, respondents were asked uh, which they would prefer to uh, institute within Wash Hill. Um, and we see that reinforcing the seawall was the, um, the highest chosen option. Um, so this, this is just an example of a question where we had them rank uh, historical characteristics one to five. And here is the breakdown of how that all happens. As you move left to right, you can see that the, uh, the blue here is the priority number one. So Napa Tree Point is overwhelmingly ranked first. And then as you can see, the breakdown moves on from there. Turn the screen. Uh, we also featured a question um, on who should be responsible for the burden of payment uh, within Watch Hill for these resiliency projects. Uh, and we supplied respondents with seven options. Um, these seven options uh, are listed here in this graph. And we can see that uh, most people feel that um, the Rhode Island and uh, federal uh, government should um, you know, bear most of the burden as well as taxpayers within Watch Hill. Um, we asked them, we also asked them the practicality of phasing out automobiles on Bay Street. As you can see, most people said that that would not be practical at all. We also found in another question that most visitors access Bay Street by automobile. So um, in conclusion, uh, we learned that participants are more worried about a hundred year storm event than coastal sl uh, flooding. And that Napa Tree Point is valued as the most important historical characteristic by residents. Uh, we also found that participants prefer reinforcing the seawall to other proposed resilience options. And uh, out of the 16 individuals who are willing to pay to preserve the flying horse carousel, the average willingness to pay was $306. Um, also, of the 23 individuals who are willing to pay for resiliency projects uh, as a whole within Watch Hill, the average willingness to pay was $469.50. So uh, if willingness to pay was implemented, it would result in a 0.07% um, increase in the respondent's property taxes, uh, generating roughly uh, $296,000 annually for resiliency projects within Watch Hill. And thank, thank you very you. much. Yep. And right, uh, thanks, also, guys. Could Go I ahead. give a shout out as well to uh, Vasu Gar for helping us with the uh, Qualtrics. We, should, we wouldn't have been able to do it without her. Great. Thank you, guys. All right, so um, I'm sorry we went over time, um, but uh, I'd like to uh, open up for any questions people might have. I'm going to save my questions for Friday. I think this was yep. fantastic as a nice snapshot of the questions you guys pulled together. I know you really worked hard in the last part of the semester, so I will save my questions for Friday, but I'm happy to take any other questions from the audience before we wrap up for today. Yeah, Frank, um, can you unshare your screen, yeah. please? trying to figure that out um just go to the bottom of the screen it says share screen yeah it's not uh it's like not popping up at all um yeah go go to the very top it says stop sharing uh, okay there we go yep sorry about yeah. that thank you, thank you. Okay. okay questions from the audience I just wanted to mention, uh, if I could, I'm sitting here in my kitchen, which I'm so sick of, um, <laughs> is that um, <clears throat> this is an incredible learning experience, Emmy and, <clears throat> and Chris. I mean, my students have gotten more information today from the, from the two groups of other students 
that is going to help them immensely professionally and bring them to a different level than other competing people for the same positions. I mean, this is just incredible. I listen to um, your students, Emmy, and it's like, how could people make numbers seem so easy? You know, landscape architects have trouble passing the mathematics requirements, which is really basic. And you guys have presented this information in such a clear and precise manner that you can walk away with something. You can go, when you're working in office, or you can go, oh, I can go back to this and I'll, I'll, I'll get a tutorial from this, uh, <clears throat> from this, um, uh, this experience. And, uh, and the same with you, Chris, you know, the students are petrified of engineers. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're frightened of going into uh, multidiscipline offices and uh, so this is this is wonderful. I'm just sitting here thinking, this is a great experience. And Pete August, I want to thank you too for bringing so much to the table and being so kind and spending time with the students. And Teresa, you know, you're always there for us. You're embedded into our department. So thank you very much. And uh, it's just been just phenomenal. And uh, and I can't wait to hear the uh, other two groups' presentations on the next two Fridays. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, your students were also very helpful to us as well. Thank you. You guys were amazing. Thanks, Richard. Um, just so I will send out a reminder email for um, the, for the last two presentations of the semester will be uh, the resource economics students will do their full presentations this Friday at 11 o'clock. So I'll send the Zoom link around for that. And then I haven't yet put the WebEx um, link for the ocean engineers on Friday, May 8th, but I will put that in the next email as well. Um, and we will be converting this recording to video. Um, so thanks to Pete August for giving me the right software to use to do that. Um, once Zoom has a chance to sort of boil all this down and process it, we'll get that video wrapped up and available to share. Um, so with that, I would like to do a last call for any questions and really, oh, Deborah, go for it. Yeah, um, and I can get more focused on questions uh, on Friday if that's uh, more appropriate, but um, two questions two questions. Uh, one was, you had the uh, chart that at some point I'd love to see again Friday or whenever the presentation is again, that would be good to see, um, where you listed the priorities of your respondents in terms of what they would be interested to preserve or, um, or prioritize. So that I needed a little more explanation to understand your chart there. And then secondly, I, I was fascinated by your calculations of willingness to pay and how much, et cetera. I was stunned um, at how split it is that about half of the population was not interested in, in paying to save the carousel and about half of the population was. And then there were 15, I guess if you got 38 responses, only 23 respondents were interested in paying to uh, have a resiliency solution um, in Watch Hill. And so 15 people said they were willing to pay nothing. That was stunning to me. Um, and uh, wondering if you could include those people that aren't willing to pay in part of your presentation, you know, going forward. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the graph that you were referring to, is it's a little jumbled because there's a lot of information on it. Um, if you get a chance to actually study it, it makes more sense. But uh, we also, on our long presentation, should have a normalized one. So it'll all just be a bar graph that's ranked and a little easier to understand. And then, um, yeah, as for the other ones, we will have graphs most likely on the reasons for why they were unwilling to pay, the, those that said that they weren't, yeah, in the long presentation. I've, I've got a question. Um, to, I didn't know that there was, in your question, you mentioned the carousel, um, a project, and I'm not really quite sure what that, what that meant. Uh, we just had a second willingness to pay question that was pertaining just to the carousel. If they were willing to 
any sort of solution that would be viable, would they be willing to donate or, you know, contribute to it as part of a property tax increase or some other method? Right. Thank you. I had a quick question. Um, I was curious about the response and the sort of support for the seawall option, which obviously seawalls are, are nice, strong structures, but they do have complications, especially in a setting like that where you have a, um, a barrier island system and the possibility for overwash. I just wonder if, if um, the, those asked have thought about, people often see the good side of a wall, but I'm curious if there's any negative aspects that, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed some of the earlier presentations, but um, does the community see any challenges of uh, if you had an over if you had an extreme event, what negative consequences a wall could have or a false sense of security it can provide? Thanks. Um, that's difficult to uh, answer because w the way we presented it in our survey was sort of like here are options that we've been verified as viable to a certain extent. We didn't necessarily re reference the, the negatives that could come from them, I guess. If that answers your question, sure. Thanks. And, and as somebody who took the survey, I assumed that the question was to rebuild or or uh, refurbish the existing seawall that is already mm -hmm. in the village. So uh, maybe I didn't understand that question right, but um, I think that's what most people assumed that since there is an existing seawall, that it would be made to be higher or fortified in some way, and uh, and therefore the solution already existed so yes plus yeah you're minus. exactly right yeah jocelyn you get the last question before we wrap <laughs> um i i love stuff like this i think it's really interesting to pick people's brains and um try and figure out where people are coming from i think something that i would um a question that i would add is i understand that it's a um anonymous survey and so you don't you're not trying to identify the person but perhaps a question on um, their neighborhood or relationship within Watch Hill because I think that there could be um, a correlation potentially with somebody's willingness to pay and if they're located on Bay Street or if they're located um, on a higher ground or if they're a business owner or something so I, I think that there is a way to dig a little bit deeper into that willingness to pay. Um, but that's it. Um, great job on your presentation. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. There definitely, there's a few questions in our survey that weren't represented in this presentation that may touch on a little of that, but obviously we could dive much deeper into that sort of thing as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you to the faculty. Thank you to all of the students. Thank you to our Watch Hill stakeholders and partners. Um, this was a great morning. I agree with Grant that the three hours did go by incredibly fast. Um, and we'll look forward to having some of you uh, join us on uh, this coming Friday and next Friday for the economics and um, uh, engineering presentations. The landscape architecture presentation from last week is available on video. I think Pete did circulate that. So if you want to see that video, I'm happy to circulate that link um, to the YouTube site. And with that, I wish you all good health and a good day. And um, take care and see you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.